discuss a potential half cent um, sales tax that could be placed on the November 2016 ballot. It is nice to have so many new faces at our meeting. Um, and so I appreciate all of you particularly for coming out. I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome both to all the authority members and to those of you in the audience, Ms. Terri Ann Grover, who is joining us after years in Vallejo and other places, and she is now essentially taking the position that was held for many years by Denise Rosenbaum. So welcome, Terri Ann, and it's nice to see all these people came out to see you. <laughs> so if we could all join um, with the Pledge of Allegiance, and Terri Ann, would you mind leading us this evening in the pledge? <laughs> allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. So the next item on our agenda is public comment. This is an opportunity for people to comment on an item that is not on this evening's agenda but within our purview. There will be time to comment on the agenda items as we go through them. Um, so I have, if you are interested in making a public comment, please fill out a, a speaker slip. And because we have so many of you here tonight, I'm going to ask that we ask everyone to limit their comments to two minutes as opposed to our normal three. Uh, because while the number of speakers is higher than normal, the amount of time we have isn't more than we would usually have. So I have one person who wishes to speak under public comment. And that is Chris Shankar. Welcome. So I'm Chris Shankar. I'm a citizen of the town of San Ramon. And the question I have here is, if you go down the southbound stretch of 680 from Walnut Creek to Milpitas, there's a segment between Crow Canyon and Alcosta Boulevard that does not have a sound barrier wall. In the last 10 years, the amount of traffic on 680 has gone up 60, 70 percent. And many of us in homes that are on the west side, uh, right off, off of San Ramon Valley Boulevard, we can hear this traffic 24 hours a day. It certainly affects a uh, lot of our quality of life. And I have one of my neighbors also here. And I believe there is a groundswell of support to see if a noise abatement study can be done. What we're really looking for is direction from you on where to start and how about you know how to go about doing this. Because I've started this effort since 2005, and it's been 10 years, and I've gotten nowhere, and I'm really looking for direction on how to proceed. Thank you. So it's, it's, it's not on tonight's agenda, but I would ask you to speak. Um, is Hisham in the audience? No. OK. Uh, Randy, so maybe if you could speak to Mr. Iwasaki, uh, you know, outside of the normal course of the meeting, that, that would be great. Yes. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak during this public comment portion of the meeting? Oh, okay, right. Um, Nathaniel Arnold. Welcome, sir. My name is uh, Nathaniel Arnold. I work for AC Transit, and I'm an ATU 192 organizer and community activist. I'm here to speak about increasing funding for AC Transit. I attended a couple of uh, meetings of WICTAC a couple of weeks ago, and I asked a, a question that Director Wallace, who sits on the WICTAC board, uh, stated that the adequate needs of the citizens here in this county have not been addressed when it comes to transportation over the last 16 years. I am one of those people that takes transit myself. I take the uh, BART from uh, Pittsburgh and the bus to get to work in East Oakland. I'm what they call uh, AC Transit uh, Special Forces. I'm a board operator, which means that I literally work all over the service county that AC Transit has jurisdiction. I've worked on the 72 line, and as a direct result of the money that was funded from Measure BB, the passage of Measure BB, 
we were able to increase headway significantly on that line, which were initially 20 minutes apiece and no weekend service on the 72R. And I can tell you as a driver that we had standing loads of people that were just miserable. But because of that initial funding provided by Measure BB, that 20 minutes went down to seven and a half minutes. And we have a service on the 72R on the weekend where we did not have that before. And it has made uh, it more accessible to our citizens that use transportation to get more jobs, to have better access to education, to better themselves. It's made it better for our seniors who don't have to maneuver around uh, their um, transportation needs to get to medical and dental appointments. It's made it better for the uh, school uh, people so that they can uh, go to after school programs and have access to jobs. That everyone limit their comments this evening to two minutes. Yes. I think you've reached that. Okay, well, I, I would just <laughs> like to say in closing that uh, Frederick Douglass said in reaching the great society that we are no greater than the least among us. And there's only three things that separate all of us in this room, beliefs, egos, and fear. Let's do the right green, uh, thing and increase funding for AC Transit. Thank you. The other speaker I have under public comment is Julio Stack. Again, is, is this about the expenditure plan or about something unrelated to that? Okay. Thank you. Welcome. And again, if you'd limit your comments to two minutes, please. Uh, when Highway 4 bypass was planned, why was the negative impact on Byron Town Township not considered? Also, what is gained by taking property from 15075 Byron Road for a right-hand turn lane onto a dead-end street that goes to the Byron sewer ponds? Also, in the interest of health and safety, for the last half century, we have spoke for four-way stop signs, no signal lights. Okay. Thank you for your comments, you. Reps. Um, I think a member of staff will contact you and, and follow up. Okay. All right. Um, any other, anyone else wish to speak during the public comment period as opposed to on a specific agenda item? Seeing none, that brings us to item D, the approval of our meeting minutes from our special meeting of February 17th. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Romick, second by Commissioner Hudson. Any other comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. So we've got um, five items to discuss under the development of the potential transportation plan. The, the first one really is just a reminder of what the process is. The second is to, to look at the draft TEP, and the third is the comments. I would ask that the commissioners agree to take particularly public comments on item two and three simultaneously. Um, and then we've got a discussion on the urban limit line, and so I'd ask that we not discuss that under the TEP process. And then finally, a discussion of the draft governing structure, including a proposed citizen oversight committee. And again, that we not take that under item 1.2. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn the discussion of item 1.1 over to Mr. Chittenden. Great, thank you, Chair Tatson. Commissioners, I'll uh, be brief on this item. Uh, Chair mentioned much of what I was going to talk about in terms of uh, setting up the rest of the agenda. I did want to uh, display the schedule again. We've uh, seen this at some prior meetings. Um, <clears throat> so uh, tonight we're going to, uh, as explained by the chair, walk through the initial draft uh, transportation expenditure plan that was made public first on February 22nd. Um, we knew going into this that the expenditure plan had certain pieces that were, were incomplete, and we'll talk about that as we walk th through it, and then we knew that there are, were areas that needed additional information or definition. So there's still quite a bit of uh, work to be done, and, and really this is, uh, I think, the start of the discussion here at uh, CCTA. Uh, getting the uh, initial draft out is, is working. We're getting a lot of comments, so we'll, we'll, we'll uh, provide an overview of the comments that we've uh, Received today, we'll get some comments here tonight, and then we'll get some additional comments from you. So um, looking at the schedule, kind of working it backwards a little bit, I uh, really want to focus on the next couple of months uh, 
between now and the middle of May to get to the point where we have to have the final TEP. So we have, uh, currently we have two uh, additional meetings scheduled here in March to get through this first phase uh, shown in the, uh, the orange bar, uh, getting out a draft TEP. Tonight we're really asking you to listen, um, listen to us as we explain the initial draft TEP, listen to the comments, listen to each other, um, knowing that you'll see a new draft, an updated draft for our meeting next Wednesday night. So. Uh, uh, we really want you to, to uh, listen to what, the changes we're going to make and the comments that we're getting. And what we really want you to do as we go through and talk about what to expect between now and next week, uh, give us the input for the highlights where you think we're really missing the mark. So that, that's going to be most of the agenda here, at least the items 1.2 and 1.3. Uh, as explained by the chair, we will have an, a, a continu continuation of the discussion on the urban limit line. And then we're going to introduce some sections that we've talked about briefly related to governing structure and some implementation guidelines. And those two sections, we really do want to get your comments because uh, this, well, with the urban limit line, that's a continuing discussion. And the governing structure and the uh, implementing guidelines is really the first time that you've seen that and had a chance to comment on those. So uh, we'll bring back an updated draft next week. And that's really when we want you to roll up your sleeves and, and start uh, giving us the, the more specific direction on what you would like to see in this uh, draft. Again, uh, aiming towards uh, having a draft that you're comfortable with on March 29th, our meeting on March 29th, something that you can get behind and uh, go try to uh, promote with your RTPCs, the other RTPCs members and the, the other members of your council. So that's, uh, that's what we want to do here through the next couple of meetings. Broad overview today, update that we'll bring back to you next week, and then two meetings where you can really refine that to something that hopefully uh, at least the board members uh, that sit on this body has consensus and willing to take that out and sell it to the, your, uh, your, your other uh, uh, members of the RTPCs and the council. So I think that really covers, well, I, I'm sorry, then um, after that, April will be another period of listening um, we'll be asking the RTPCs to comment on that draft. We'll be working with EPAC both as the entire body. We have a meeting scheduled for April 7th. We'll continue our small group meetings with members of EPAC. We'll get comments from the public. Um, currently, we have a meeting scheduled for April 6th, I believe it is, the first Wednesday of April, and then another special meeting uh, coinciding with our regular board meeting on the third Wednesday of of April. Um, if we do keep the, the first meeting on April 6th, we want to make sure that that's a working meeting discussing the draft. We do not want to use that as a convenient uh, reason to slip our March 29th schedule. We really need to keep that date. Otherwise, we're going to be cutting ourselves too short for any kind of review in April. So um, I don't know if we want to talk about it here tonight or maybe next uh, next week uh, about whether that meeting is really necessary and what we would do at that meeting. Um, we'll regroup on the first Wednesday of May with another uh, draft that has the input that we've, we've received in April. That will be another intense working session, uh, again, with the goal of having the uh, final draft ready to circulate to the cities for their adoption and to the counties for their adoption. Um, at our May uh, special meeting on the third Wednesday of the month. So we really have a tight timeline. We have lost count of that. It's about five meetings, four or five meetings. So there's a, a lot of work to do. And I'll end my comments, and hopefully we can get at it. I ask the authority members as we go through tonight's meeting and also the meeting on the 16th that so you think about, and we'll come back to discuss it on your calendar, whether we should schedule a fourth meeting for March depends upon how far we think we're getting. I don't think it's appropriate to commit now. Commissioner Abelson, you had a comment? Uh, question. Yeah, I just had a question about the inclusion of the RTPC's recent comments uh, for next week. Yeah. They're not here. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I had that in my notes, and I was trying to go through that without reading my notes. So I certainly WICTAC has already provided your comments. Um, trans plan and trans pack meet this week. 
uh, SWATS meeting about three times a month now. <laughs> so um, we'll include what we have. And certainly we can include the WICTAC, and then uh, depending on what comes out of TransPlan and TransPAC tomorrow, we'll include that as well. Any other questions or comments about this by any members of the authority or members of the public? Okay, uh, Elaine Welch. And Elaine, I don't know if you were here when we started this meeting, but we're going to ask everyone for two minutes, right? Welcome. I'm going to try to take one. Okay. <laughs> A lot of people to talk. I want to thank you for allowing us to speak tonight. I was at your last meeting and felt very warmly received on a topic about, it's actually number 12 in the draft, which is accessible transportation for seniors and people with disabilities. We are working very hard at Mobility Matters to bring this to fruition while we speak around the entire county, but we have no funding from Measure J or from any TEP, and we're working very hard to leverage what funding we have. This we see as an incredible opportunity. Free programs are not free to run, and we appreciate uh, very much that we are included in this and hope you will continue to not only consider it, but as all of us want with the pie, I assume a larger piece of the pie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on item 1.1? If not, then we'll move on to a combination of items 1.2 and 1.3, which deal with the draft TEP that was distributed on February 25th and also the comments that we've received since then. Mr. Chittenden again. Great. Thank you, Chair. And I'll uh, be tag teaming with Bill Gray, with uh, Gray Bowen Scott, our uh, consultant for this effort. Um, so this uh, is, is agendized as an information item to provide you with an overview and status on the initial draft TEP. Um, so I'm going to actually walk through this document uh, category by category. Uh, the intent here is to give you an, an overview of what we are trying to say in, in the, the draft TEP and some of the thought that went into the process of putting this together. Um, and then uh, really just seek your concurrence on direction, again, where um, you think that what we have in here is, is missing the mark. And I'll, again, I will try to identify those areas where we know we're going to be making changes between this draft and what you will see next week. So you, uh, you may wish to follow along in your packet because I'm going to be going through it kind of page by page. And uh, uh, you can either listen and, or, or follow through. So um, beginning on page uh, one, dash two dash five it's, it's, it's attachment a to the staff report um, we're including uh, a draft preface and the preface is a combination of uh, the goals the vision and goals that were adopted by this body when you adopted the principles for development of a transportation expenditure plan so that's the top half of the page here with the six uh, goals listed and then the, the bottom part of the page, which are the implementation goals, this is really a synthesis of discussion that we had with the EPAC, uh, again, as we worked with them to put together a vision and principles for, for what they wanted to see out of the TEP. Um, we believe, staff and the consultant team believe that they're compatible. Um, you'll see that there are some strike through and, and markups on the uh, the introduction paragraph and a couple of initial bullets, and that is just to alert you that those are some suggested changes from the principal document. So that initial paragraph and what was previously five bullets was, was taken word for word out of the principal's document. So we showed it in, in uh, uh, strike through and changes just to alert you that those are suggested changes from what you've adopted. So. If you have any comments on that, we'll, we'll look for that later as we go through the, the document. Um, attachment B, starting on page 1.2-7 of your packet, is really the meat of the expenditure plan. Um, the outline on page 2 highlights the major sections, and this is really organized very similar to what you saw in Measure J. So it's something we're familiar with, and we thought we would just start with that. Um, so we're, we're going, we'll go walk through the uh, 
uh, table of allocations, the summary of the projects and programs, some of the policies. The last four bullets on that outline, complete streets program, regional advanced uh, mitigation program, governing structure, implementing guidelines, are, are not in uh, Measure J. So those are, n are new sections that we're proposing to add, and we'll discuss each one of those as we go through. Um, page three is a table of allocations that add up to 100% of the projected revenue. Um, the notes uh, on the right column just are to, to note that we had an early version of this that went out with an error, so we just wanted to correct for folks that saw the early version that um, we did uh, are recommending, or we're not recommending, but we're including in this version 140 million, which represents 6% of the overall revenue for community development investment grant program. And uh, to, to fund that at that level, we reduced the regional choice category. And again, I'll walk through each of these items line by line. The detailed description starts on page 5 of 30 of the TEP. So category 1 is the local streets maintenance and improvement. Um, this program is consistent with uh, Measure J. Um, the return to source, um, it's a subject of compliance with the authority's reporting, audit, and growth management program requirements, maintenance of effort and potentially uh, in including some additional checklist items that have been subject of uh, our discussions over the last several special uh, uh, authority meetings. Um, just a little more background, at our February 3rd meeting, there was consensus to fund this at a minimum of 18%, and then to consider an additional return to source amount as an incentive to stimulate housing production um, or expenditures for non-motorized transportation purposes. Uh, we talked about this again at our February 17th meeting where we shared a proposal from the Public Managers Association to fund this category of the return to source at 23% and eliminate proposal for the uh, incentive uh, program. Um, and that, that followed a meeting of PMA, uh, Public Managers Association representatives and several EPAC mem members um, where the PMA members vehemently, vehemently opposed this type of incentive program. They just felt it was putting agencies in competition and it just did not work. So this initial draft includes the PMA proposal. Um, I think I'd like to flag this and uh, I think, you know, I'm sure Bill will talk about it a little bit more on our, under the next item. Um, I'm sure this will remain a contentious issue. Uh, you're likely to hear comments to that regard tonight if you uh, Refer to attachment B to the next item, item 1.3. It's a joint letter from Bay Area Council, BIA, and the East Bay Leadership Council, which strongly encourages the authority to condition at least 5% of return to source towards achieving housing production. Um, so uh, I, uh, I'm sure this is one of the topics we'll continue to discuss as we go forward. Um, category 2 is major streets, complete streets, traffic sync signal synchronization program. Um, the RTPCs requested $280 million for this category, so I think as we go through the RTPC review, it's likely to see that the, the, the funding in here that we show at $200 million may increase. Um, this category is to address traffic smoothing in a responsible way that provides major streets as facilities for all users, cars, bus, uh, bicyclists, and pedestrians. Um, later, we'll talk about a proposed complete streets policy. Um, that, that policy is, when we get to that, we'll see that it's being replaced. So when you get your um, next version of this, uh, I think you'll see the category or the description for this category and the complete streets policy. We'll see some major revisions, so we'll bring that to you next week. Category three is the BART capacity, access and parking improvements, shown at $300 million. And uh, we discussed this at length at our last meeting on February 17th. Um, there's strong support from mem many members of EPAC for additional BART cars as well as some of the other improvements shown. Um, many folks oppose uh, using the land around BART stations for additional parking. They see that there would be better use for that land in, in transit-oriented developments or other types of developments and don't want to see additional um, parking near those stations. Um, there will continue to be uh, uh, outstanding issues related to the discussions on a regional solution to acquiring the BART cars. 
So uh, we talked about that on February 17th. I don't think there's really anything to add to that discussion that uh, at least Randy and I have been part of, and maybe Director Murray, if there's any update, you can do that when we get into discussions. And then uh, recently there's been other concerns expressed about any level of funding for BART. So I, obviously this is going to be a category that we'll be discussing quite a bit going forward. Category four is the East Contra Costa Transit Extension, so that's BART or other kind of high capacity transit. Um, this uh, item is consistent with the trans plan ask. Uh, again, the intent is to provide high quality and higher frequency transit further in the East County. Um, the amount shown obviously would not fund an EBART extension to Brentwood, so how this actually gets used, we're looking the language includes uh, the ability to look at alternatives. Um, Ross, if I could interrupt you after the, yeah. at, after the end of this sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know what the sentence was going to end. I think I just so, ended uh, my sentence. <laughs> well, and all I wanted to say was uh, we'd expected Supervisor Glover here this evening, and I think he's still coming. I'm working on it here, believe but, me. But uh, Supervisor Pifo is in the audience, and she is the alternate. So if you would like to come up, we'd be... We checked that. She is not the alternate. Oh, she's not. No, believe me. So it's, That's it's, why I'm texting It's back Supervisor and Anderson for both of you? She's coming. Okay. All right. And I'm sure she would have liked to talk about EBAR. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. This one make and sure. Because Candace is running into traffic, and so I'm trying to tell her whether to. <laughs> so we may have Ms. Pifo up here. So we do that. Made, need to do that major streets category. That's right. Right. <laughs> All right. So uh, picking up where I was. So we have la the language al allows for um, an initial transit center. Uh, if, if we're unable to leverage these dollars into a full BART extension, that's often, that's very common, these kind of extensions start with a transit center and, and then uh, uh, BART will make its way out there. Um, one point I would say uh, you can expect that the next version of this, uh, of the draft will have the language removed requiring, regarding acquiring BART cars from this category. That's really more appropriate from the prior category three. Um, categories 5, 6, and 7 are very similar in the intent, which is to address traffic flow on our major commute corridors. Um, the problems on these corridors affect cars, they affect buses, they affect cars and buses trying to get to BART stations. So clearly uh, uh, many, many of our folks are experiencing delays and loss of uh, uh, time with their families or jobs while they sit on these corridors. Um, we've seen significant increase in delays on these corridors in the last five years or so, or maybe the last two or three years as the economy re rebounds. Um, I-80 continues in, in the morning as the worst commute co corridor in the Bay Area. Uh, northbound 680 is now the fifth worst uh, commute corridor in the Bay Area. So the co these categories as are written right now are, are intended to use flexible language. A lot of the solution are being defined uh, almost as we speak. Um, starting with Category 5, the I-80, as, as I think we all know, WICTAC is working on a high-capacity transit study that would help define how transit solutions can address this chronic uh, congestion on the corridor. Now, we do know that the study will not be completed by the election, so we're trying to keep the language flexible so that they can use the funding of, uh, for, for the out, to implement the outcomes of the study. Um, as uh, Commissioner Abelson uh, mentioned, WICTAC met last week and commented on this category. Their recommendation is that we take $30 million from this category and add it to Category 10 for the bus operations. Um, they'd like to see us break out $60 million for specific purposes to improve interchanges, including $55 million to complete Phase 2 of the San Pablo Dam Road interchange. Phase 1, as uh, you, you may know, is... Uh, under construction, and then that would allow them to keep $25 million to implement the results of that study. So we'll, we'll build that into the next uh, uh, update. Category 6 is for 680 and Highway 24, and this is to complete uh, um, the uh, carpool lanes and express lane network, implement the recommendations from the recently completed transit study, and to make improvements on the 680-24 interchange that are being scoped right now under a joint MTC and CCTA study. 
Um, the funding would also be used for interchange improvements on both 680 and 24. Um, I will note that we're getting a strong push from many fronts, uh, business community and others, to increase funding in this category to $200 million. So uh, I don't know that we will do that in the next draft, but we'll be able, you know, certainly something we'll continue to discuss. Category 7 is Highway 4 and 242. And uh, I just want to report there's two efforts underway to inform how the funding would be used in this category. The first is the State Route 4 Integrated Corridor Mobility Project that we're, we're undertaking funded from uh, grants from the USDOT. And there's a small amount of Measure J available on the project, and uh, this would augment that. Um, we also, we're in the process now of, of coordinating that project with planning for operational improvements over Willow Pass project. So that will, those improvements were identified uh, through the corridor system management plan that was developed when we were widening Highway 4. So we're in a scoping process for that, and I think there's some really exciting opportunities to use both the technology and the ICM and some spot improvements, some infrastructure improvements on, to take care of some of the problem that those tr of you that travel over Willow Pass in the morning are experiencing. Category 6 is Julie's favorite category, 684 interchange. Uh, okay. <laughs> we'll take a vote, at least three. And uh, I, I think we know that's about a $400 million project, so this is just a down payment on that total cost. Uh, the funding level in here would allow us to construct the first phase of the interchange that's almost fully designed. It's the project that lost funding through the STIP process, and then we'd be able to do some additional planning for some of the later phases. Category 9 is East County Corridor. Um, the way you, I'm sure you'll hear many speakers on this topic tonight, um, the initial draft TEP calls out, we call out the Byron Highway and the proposed 239 Trilane Corridor and the Vasco Corridor. Um, I've seen materials where some folks are suggesting we should call out the James Donlin uh, project in this category as well. Um, the initial draft here has language proposed for safeguards to, excuse me, to pick the best project and a lot of references to appropriate mitigation. So that's a lot of the discussion on this project. I'm sure that's a uh, uh, the, the resolution of this funding and this project is something that I don't expect will have resolved by the end of March. Um, category 10 is proposed advanced mitigation program. The language in the document that you see, it's very similar to the language that was in San Diego's Transnet measure. A um, couple meetings ago, Gary Gallegos was here and talked about his program and uh, uh, and, about, and the overwhelming success that they've had in advanced mitigations from their most recent measure. So as I've uh, stated before, I'm working with a group to define this program. Uh, getting a little concerned on the pace of the effort here, but uh, one thing I think we all need to, to, to recognize the whole premise uh, or foundation of advanced mitigation is based on trust. So uh, we're going to, this will require that we have some trust that the pilot program uh, gets defined, likely not to be defined by May, will be defined or should be defined by November. So we're going to have to find some language that allows us to bridge between having the final TEP and then really knowing what we're going to be able to implement prior to the election. So we'll need to keep a, keep a watch on this category. Um, category 12, non-rail transit enhancements. We talked about this at our meeting on February 17th. Probably hear a lot of comments on this as well. Uh, first, you're going to hear that uh, the name needs to include the word bus. And uh, so we're gonna, we've been working to include the name or the word bus in both the, uh, the name and the description of the category. But we do still v feel very strongly that uh, we want to keep the language flexible enough to adopt uh, the evolution that are, is likely to occur in public transportation over the next 25 years. If you recall, if you were here on February 17th, you've heard Rick Ramis here speak to that point. So we think it's very important. Second comment you're likely to hear is the funding level. Um, the RTPC is originally requested $219 million, which is a little above what we showed here. As I mentioned, WICTAC has already requested an additional $30 million. I think TransPAC may be considering some additional funding here. Um, you may hear speakers uh, talk about trying to achieve 15-minute headways for um, the major routes. Um, 
one of the documents we discussed at EPAC, I don't recall if it ever came here, was transit operators provided an estimate that that would take roughly a billion dollars to get to 15-minute headway. So it's something we're going to have to work on, you know, what's the right amount of funding and the right amount of service. So something uh, somewhere in between, I'm sure. Category 12 is uh, transportation for seniors and people with disabilities. Elaine just spoke with that. I think this is the one category where we haven't heard anything negative, so I'm happy to report that. Uh, <laughs> except we probably need to look at some additional funding. The language that you're reading here needs to be cleaned up to be similar to uh, some of the other categories. So really this one, it's, it's cleaning up the verbiage, um, trying to find a way to figure out what's the right funding. The RTPCs requested $105 million. Um, we put a lower number, maybe it's a little too low, recognizing that if we implement the mobility management strategies, we're going to get some efficiencies, and that efficiency could actually uh, spill over into the existing Measure J funding. Um, category 13, safe transportation for children. This really just expands the very popular Measure J programs. Um, RTPCs requested $77 million. I'm sure as they go through their, um, their, their review, they'll probably – come back with some requests to increase that. Uh, 14, our city rail and ferries. We've combined this category. Originally came in from the RTPC, a certain amount of funding for rail, a certain amount of money for ferries. Um, all the cities that currently have an inner city rail stop are also planning ferry. So we think it makes a lot of sense if by combining this and providing some flexibility, at the, for example, if the ferries don't get off the ground, probably not a good metaphor, um, but uh, the, the, the funding could be used in the inner city rail or vice versa. Um, so I think you may get some comments about that, of the feasibility of some of the, the ferry lines, but we're trying to address that by having this flexibility between rail and ferry. Uh, pedestrian bike trail facilities are very much similar to Measure J. The only comment we're really getting on that is, is try to find a way to increase the funding on that category. 16, um, this is a proposed new funding category intended to stimulate production of housing or the production of jobs uh, with the intent of eliminating long commutes and particularly commutes outside of the county. We discussed this on February 3rd special meeting, um, kind of turning into a little bit of a love it or hate it category. Um, probably be a stretch to say the city managers love it, but they do like the fact that this is an, an idea to provide additional funding for local uh, uh, local funding to improve cities. Again, attachment B of the next item, 1.3, Barry Council, BIA East Bay Leadership Council letter opines that this carrot approach just doesn't work. Um, and I know the Board of Supervisors talked about this a little bit. I think I really like the, the comment and the, the intent of the program. I want some uh, additional clarification of the words, but there is a concern that it might just get watered down and be a pass-through program. So I think that's the, the, some of the comments from the board and some of the comments from uh, Bay Area Council, BIA, and East Bay Leadership Council are a little bit similar, that uh, uh, if we're going to have this program, we need to find something that really works and there needs to be some teeth to it. So I'm sure this will continue to be an open dialogue for uh, w well past March. Um, innovative Transportation Technology Connected Communities Program. It's, this really combines three concepts. One is, uh, A, we want to develop, um, uh, we want a program that we can use as seed funding, hopefully leverage funding, to develop and demonstrate transportation innovations through real-world applications. Um, the funding amount would be less than a million a year, and hopefully we can leverage those funds to deploy new, new technology. And the idea here is to test the, these innovations in real-world situations. And for the pilots that work, they would get funded out of another category, just not a lot of funding here. So it's really kind of a revolving set of uh, innovations that we could deploy, uh, see what works, and then roll that out through funding and other programs. B is relatively simple, uh, geared towards uh, – the similar size pot geared towards funding activities where the primary purpose is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then C is to implement connected transportation solutions. Um, uh, when Randy talks here, you hear the word smart city application. They didn't really want to use that w word because not everybody lives in a city. 
So trying to come up with a more generic term, but it's really um, using this small amount of fund to implement the smart city concepts. And the amount of funding here, that really doesn't require a lot. So we think there's enough here where combined with other funds we're likely to uh, uh, leverage with this. Every city or town that wants to participate should be able to participate with the level of funding in here. Um, category 1820 and it's planning and admin, those are similar to Measure J. Um, we're proposing that the funding for the planning category, we could do that at a lower amount since there's a 17 years of overlap between Measure J and this program. And then category 19 is not a real category. This is to give the RTPC room to add funding levels. WICTAC already done some of that. In fact, WICTAC proposing that we use part of this to bring back sub-regional needs program. So that's a small pot of money that remains flexible for to address unknown future uh, uh, needs. It's uh, similar to the sub-regional need category in Measure J. And I'm sure other RTPCs will make recommendations either for additional <laughs> to boost funding in different categories here or potentially for other purposes. So um, I'm almost done here. If we turn to the next several pages, 13 to 20, this is a restatement, actually word for word, of the Growth Management Program and its attachment A, the principles of agreement for establishing the urban limit line. Um, the uh, the urban limit line discussion will be later on the agenda. We do know we need to uh, update the growth management program. Um, we'll have, well, the goal is that we'll have a version for you to look at next week. That might be a little bit of a stretch. As, as you know, through our discussions here, there's quite a bit of negotiation for changes that should uh, occur in that section. We've noted some of these in the, the notes on the margin on the page. So, um, many outstanding issues. So the next version is likely to include some proposals for some proposals for additional checklist requirements, um, agricultural protections, maybe a few other items. So uh, ultimately we need to get there. If we get there by next week, that's something I'm not ready to commit to right now, but that's, that's our intent. Um, 20, pages 21 and 22 are the complete streets policy. Um, Work's been continuing on that over the next week. So this, uh, this is a new section. Um, the, the comment I'd like to make right now is this section is being completely rewritten. That was completed, I believe, yesterday. So you'll see a complete new section on that. So uh, if you have any comments on the complete streets policy, you can give us some uh, direction if you'd like. But uh, you'll see a complete separate, complete new version next week that's been worked out with Dave Campbell, among others. Um, I've already discussed the Regional Advanced Mitigation Program, which is on page 23. That, that obviously will get some additional work as we go through the pilot. The Governing Structure, pages 24 through 26, and Implementing Guidelines. These, again, are new sections, and we'll cover those uh, under item 1.5 later in the agenda. So that was a, a quick walkthrough. Happy to answer any questions. Actually, I think I'm going to turn it over to Bill before we get to that point. And, um, the, he's he's going to cover item 1.3, which is the uh, summary and highlight of the comments that we've received that I haven't talked about. Thank you, Ross. Has this been passed on? Yeah. Okay. The um, – oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we've not been without a few comments on the draft. So it's an understatement. So um, our focus in this initial draft, is, as Ross indicated, was released and, and presented to the EPAC group. We've had two, two um, good meetings of that group and, and received a lot of comments. And I'm not going to try to go through the comments, but, but starting on page 1.3.1 uh, <coughs> and, and, and following, there's a whole uh, series of comments. And what we've been uh, trying to do, and I think fairly successfully, is to just document and acknowledge all of the comments being received. And this, this chart is a work in progress. We expect to add to it with comments we may receive tonight and, and in other venues. Um, and we are going to start populating the response column. And it may be, responses may be as simple as you're going to see some changed language in version two or, or others. But so that's the, that's the real approach. And um, without going into a lot of detail on the kinds of comments, up on the screen here is a, a little uh, poll that we did with the EPAC at their last meeting, because what we are trying to do is, is get a sense of 
the group as a whole, what their priorities were, and then we ask a couple kind of leading questions, you know, what, what would you see getting more funding and what would you see getting less funding? And I think what we did is we proved we have a diverse group. We have a diverse group of folks representing a variety of perspectives. And, um, you know, these – I would ask you to just look at this. The, the items along the bottom are the, basically the elements of the expenditure plan draft. And you can see by the height of the bars the importance of the, of the various issues. Um, no real surprises other than, than – for the most part, everybody has some favorite projects and everybody likes, you know, various pieces of the project. So I think what it did is validated in my mind and our mind, I think, that we've got a, a good diverse group of folks. If you look at the next two pages, um, okay, you've got it. Yeah, the, the, the next page two on this handout or the, and the one that's on the screen really shows uh, up – Okay, well, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of the highlights then. The, what, it, what this is is the five categories that would deserve greater funding, and the height of the bar indicates that. And the, ones that the highest one was transportation for seniors and people with disabilities, followed by pedestrians and bike trail facilities, and um, the advanced mitigation program, and traffic flow in the 680 corridor. And those are the ones that, you know, that Ross has mentioned. Um, I, and people can take a look at this later. There's, a, there's copies we can make available. And then on the last page, we ask the other side of the, the equation, well, what, what funding categories would you suggest that has less funding? And given, given the fact that this was a stakeholder group made up of other than local agency officials, <laughs> um, they clearly identified local street and road maintenance as the, as the pot of money. And, I, you know, I, and I, it's – you know, it's not, not a surprise in terms of how these, these um, um, comments were received. The rest of it is pretty much spread across the board. Um, there's really no, you know, there's nothing else that really stands out. You can talk, you know, a little bit about non-rail transit, the East County Corridor, uh, inner city rail, um, again, pedestrian bike facilities, that was a high and a low, and then regional choice. So that just gives you a snapshot. It's not scientific in any way. Um, we have a lot of comments. We're processing those comments, and we uh, intend to reflect a number of them, a lot of them. And we're going we're to acknowledge all of them next week at your meeting, and we're going to incorporate a lot of uh, updates, changes, or, or clarification based on this comment. So other, unless there's questions, that's uh, – Well, and, and I think, again, this uh, illustrates the challenge we have here. Uh, whoops, I get it going in the right direction. Now I'm stuck. So the, the, what needs more funding? We see a lot of activity. Uh, I think I can have it here. Where it comes from, that's the hard part. Not many people can identify where we uh, cut to, to add funding. So uh, I think uh, that, that, that shows uh, uh, EPAC has the same view, I think, as probably a lot of us do, as a lot of categories deserve more funding, but where do we get it? So at any rate, uh, Chair, we'd like to turn it back to you. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is I have a number of speaker slips for a combination of items uh, two and three. So I would like to go through those. And as I call your name, remember that we're asking everyone to limit their comments this evening to two minutes. So I'd like to start with Vin Rover. Chair Tatson, if I can just clarify yes. that if someone is speaking on both item 1.2 and, and 1.3, that they would get four minutes. But if they were only speaking on one item, they would get two, since we agendize them as separate items. Well, I would actually hope they could limit their comments to two minutes for the co combination. I probably have 30 speaker slips here. So, all right. So, Mr. Rover, welcome. Good evening, uh, Vin Rover, 2215 Spyglass Drive in Brentwood. I uh, just want to make a couple of comments, won't take the two minutes. Uh, we just want to emphasize for the economic development of East Contra Costa, the importance of State Route 239. Um, and in addition, we'd like to see uh, the Far East BART station eventually, uh, but we, we don't want to be left out there in the cold as a cul-de-sac for any longer. We want to step up and be a vibrant community, and we feel that we need these things to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary, Mary Pifo. 
Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Chair Tatson, as was expressed at our Highway 160 on and off ramp connector grand opening recently, uh, Mr. Hudson was there. I am proud and deeply appreciative of all of you and your entire team for the delivery of another project, not only on time, but my personal favorite, under budget. <laughs> we can now drive north and south from the John A. Nedgedley Bridge, also known as the Antioch Bridge, from Far East County without having to circumnavigate the cities of Oakley and Antioch. The culmination of all of the Highway 4 projects coming together is over a billion dollars. So amazing and so much appreciated. We appreciate every single penny of it and thank you all for your leadership. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your leadership has been strong for East County projects and I beg you, I literally beg you to not lose focus regarding the newly released uh, transportation expenditure plan. We need to be very careful about where we put our precious resources that will serve the most taxpayers and where we can get the biggest bang for our limited buck. The items that East County voters will support are funding for the extension of BART into Far East, Contra Costa. Pittsburgh and Antioch are awesome stations, but they're not the end of the line. We need to continue important safety improvements to Vasco Road, an important commute route for thousands. We need roadways and highways that safely serve the majority of our residents and that provide efficient movement of goods, vehicles, and yes, even cyclists. Far East County residents have been paying into a transportation system that brought improvements to other areas of the county and region like BART, I-80, I-680, I-24, and the Caldecott Tunnel, all excellent projects, by the way, but we've only begun to see the infrastructure we need out in Far East County. I'm pleased the TEP discussion includes 5% for improvements in the East County corridor. This will help to fund progress on Trilink or State Route 239 project the Brentwood to Tracy route, and also construction of the James Donlin extension. People who do not live out there may not realize we have big rigs moving through East County and traveling across one-way bridges to the Central Valley and Interstate 5. Dave, you're out there a lot. You know what those roads and bridges look like. The 239 route is a critical corridor for goods movement that will bring jobs to where we live and benefit the entire county and region and complement the county's northern waterfront economic development initiative. I'm pleased that the draft does not attempt to meddle with the urban limit line. During the development of Measure J, every single stakeholder compromised and the result was a strong urban limit line with delineation of where growth shall and shall not occur. This has worked and there has been no abuse of the urban limit line as it's been written and supported by the voters. I encourage you to support the status quo. I believe what we have here will continue to improve mobility in the county, although we could do better for our senior population and we should. The current plan protects open space, supports a better jobs environment so more people can live where they work, allows for enhanced quality of life benefits for families, achieves reductions in greenhouse gases that come when people are not idling in traffic and goods are actually moving. Less time in traffic and congestion means more time we have with our families. Finally and separate from the expenditure plan, I'm hearing that the state has reneged funds previously promised to the I-684 interchange. The threat is a giant step backwards and our collective improvements to improve mobility. I'll do whatever I can to help you gain those dollars back. As I said earlier, thank you again for your efforts to bring dramatically improved commute times and roadway safety for the 130,000 commuters who travel along State Route 4. Over a billion dollars and we again appreciate every single penny. But we need to be represented in the new measure in order for those that I represent to see direct benefit to Far East County projects that are important and be able to support it. Lastly, you've seen important information about our proposed Marsh Creek multi-use trail to link pedestrian access, uh, bicycle and pedestrian access between Clayton and Brentwood. This is an obviously complex proposal, but it's important enough for representation in your plan, and I believe we have it there. Sure. Again, thank you for all of your hard work and the time you're investing in this effort. Don't forget us out in Far East sure. County. Thank, thank you, you so much. So our next speaker is Sal Evola, followed by Juan Pablo Galvan. I haven't counted, but over 30. <laughs> and it keeps growing. So how many people are in the room? All right. Thank you, Chair and members of the board. My name is Sal Evola. I'm a council member in Pittsburgh, chairman of the East Contra Costa Habitat Conservancy Plan, and a board member of TransPlan and the East Contra Costa Fee and Finance Authority. 
I, as well as several other electeds, also applaud this board for their leadership and what they've done for supporting transportation in eastern Contra Costa County. However, tonight I have to express a few concerns that we have regarding what we've seen thus far with the draft TEP. The City of Pittsburgh vehemently opposes further modifications and or additional requirements to the growth management plan that would be in conjunction with our ability to receive our return to source funds. We do not feel it was ever the intention of CCTA at any time or any other agency to regulate land use decisions at the local level, some of which have been expressed through the draft comments. In our opinion, there are several changes which we feel as a city are pushing the legal limits of the authority under this proposed measure. Some of these recommendations appear to violate a settlement agreement that Pittsburgh has with Transplan and ECRIFA, which some of you were very instrumental in bringing Pittsburgh back to the table. Pittsburgh has been a partner with agencies such as BART, where we were one of the first cities to fund 50% of our own BART station. We have a specific plan around our TOD village promoting livable and walkable communities to get people out of their cars. But at the same time, we want to control our own land use decisions. Let me be clear, Pittsburgh intends to use its local fees and its regional fees to build the James Donnell and extension. In our opinion, certain stakeholders and certain stakeholder groups are going way too far in their recommendations to our local land use control. I am personally prepared, if need be, on behalf of my community and the numerous calls I have received to fight this measure at the ballot box if these possible illegal modifications make it all the way to the ballot measure. If they don't, and if it's fair and balanced and preserves local control, we're gonna continue to be an advocate as we have been and as we have demonstrated. My constituents in the city of Pittsburgh expect that certain improvements are gonna be built and they expect that they could go to their city council for their local land use control and decisions. I respectfully submit these comments. Again, applaud the leadership of this board and thank you for your time. Thank you, and if I could just ask, uh, Ross, are the, are the comments we received tonight gonna to be included in updates to the comment log? Yeah, that would be the intent, okay. yes. Great, thank you. A summary and synthesis. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not, not word for word. Okay. Mr. Galvan, followed by Debbie Toth. And then followed by Claire Linder. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Juan Pablo Galvan, land use planner for Se Mount Diablo. Let me be clear. The idea that a 1970s era project, such as the James Donlan Boulevard extension, can solve the transportation problems of 2016, 2025, and 2035 is absurd. Let me be clear. Serious consideration of a project that, when evaluated against region-wide criteria that have been adopted by many planning agencies in this area, reviewed during an EPAC meeting, and was ranked as the lowest, the lowest out of more than 80 projects, 80 of the most expensive projects that were first included in the countywide transportation plan, is not only absurd, it is dangerous. We have been involved in the EPAC, a coalition of more than a dozen environmental, labor, housing, and other different types of organizations that are involved in this project, and we are not at all happy. Let me be clear, radical change is necessary. Rush hour is eight hours every day. That's the status quo. If radical change is not being proposed in this measure, what's the point? Massive changes are needed, and they are needed right now. Thank you. Right, Debbie Toth, followed by Claire Linder, and then Adele Overa. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I just wanted to... Um, say thank you. Big, fat, huge thank you. Uh, I do stand here with colleagues from the coalition at the EPAC and want to express my support for their position as well, but I just feel the need to say thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Adele Oliveira. Oh, Claire Linder, I'm sorry, first. And then, <laughs> and then Adele Oliveira 
and Linnea Juarez. Mr. Chair, could I suggest something we do at the Board of Supervisors is that as you call those names, that the people line up behind the mic. Sure. It will help all of us move more okay. quickly. Good, good idea. So Thank we you. Could, so we could ask for uh, Adele and Linnea to join the line. Good evening, Commissioners. Thank you for your time. My name is Claire Linder. I'm from Bike Concord. I wanted to thank you for your time and also to support uh, Bike East Bay's and Bike Concord's proposals for the Transportation Expenditure Plan to increase funding for bike ped categories to 5%. Parenthetically, the gentleman from San Ramon and some other commissioners had some traffic problems. I just want to put a point out there that Increasing bike and pedestrian infrastructure means those are cars that are not in your way. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, joining the line will be Steve Barr. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Adi Olvera. I'm a resident of Concord and also a member of Bike Concord. I just want to thank you for hearing us out today, and I want to express that I support Bike East Bay and Bike Concord and their efforts to advocate for cycling infrastructure that benefits families that use their bicycles. With a combination of using bus, BART, and walking to get their to get to their city to get around their cities for their personal needs. Um, like going to school, to their doctor appointments, going to get groceries, going to the store, to buy supplies for their homes. I use cycling for personal needs as well as recreational to improve the health of my family. I have been teaching my daughter to ride her bike to school, and I depend on you to make a decision that improves the cycling conditions in my city, for my family, for the children that are in my neighborhood, so we can ride safely and travel within our city to do different things, and also to travel beyond our city using trails and other streets to enjoy the benefits of our neighboring cities. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Juarez, and then Mr. Barr, and Greg Haft. Good evening. My name is Linnea Juarez. I am the chair of the Byron MAC, and I want to say I'm glad to see majority of our MAC members here tonight. I just received the notice yesterday about this meeting and the need to bring as many live speaking bodies here as we could tonight from East County. I feel very chagrined that I'm talking about a subject I know very little about. I am an accountant and I hate to talk about something when I don't know the numbers. I tried a little bit to listen to the presentation made and to look at what was on the screen. Believe me, it didn't tell me enough. Uh, I deal with this on a constant basis with my clients. I manage, do the financial management of common interest subdivisions, if you're familiar with the term homeowners associations, et cetera, around the Bay Area. And one of the things I hear from those people is, I'm tired of paying for something I don't get. I just lost a major vote in one very large association for a very large special assessment because the people that were living on the east side, believe it or not, of that particular community didn't get their roofs done, didn't get their siding done, but the people on the west side had. And the comment made is you spent our money, they got it, we didn't. And that's what I'm hearing tonight. I heard a comment made offhand that maybe the Brentwood Bi uh, BART station or eBART is not going to be on the table. Well, how long have we those of us in East County been paying for the privilege of that station to come out to us finally. They got theirs, we haven't gotten ours yet. SR 239, we have been talking about as a savior in our area for the, for the commute situation, for the truck situation, for the living, the working, and the movement of product and making our life better. We do not want to see these projects go away and disappear in the 20 categories, 30 categories that you're talking about. Thank you very much. J. 
Chairman Tats Tatson, members of the board, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, it's, it's concerning to the residents of Brentwood that I represent as a council member of the city of Brentwood, um, some 55,000 uh, residents in East County that are counting on State Route 239 to be uh, an eventuality and the planning to continue to to open that corridor, which is a multimodal corridor for East County, to not only move our residents to into the Central Valley, but our goods. Knowing that we live in a huge farmland and most of you that live in Central County never see the trucks that travel on Highway 4 over one lane bridges and down J4. They are carrying hay, cherries, corn, and they are all heading to either Stockton or Tracy. And the 239 Tri-Link is a vital connector for Brentwood. It's in our general plan that we just updated, and I urge you to put this as a high priority on your list. In addition to that, the connector to the airport is also important for future economic development in our area. And I urge you to consider and consider wisely that we keep this as part of East County and for those 55,000 residents in Brentwood that are, that are counting on you to do the right thing for them. Thank you. Okay, good evening, members of the board. Thank you. My name is Greg Hayat. I'm an Orinda resident, and I'm here representing Bike Orinda. Orinda has a vision for bike and pedestrian access. I'd like to share a part of it with you. Orinda should be a community where residents and visitors can easily, safely, and efficiently travel by bicycle or foot between and within residential areas to public transportation, to schools, and the downtown areas. This vision was approved by our city council in 2011. And I know most, if not all, cities in the county have a similar vision. When asked why our residents don't bike more or walk more, the answer we get most often is they don't feel safe. They don't feel safe letting their kids out to walk to school or bike to school. We don't see this as funding bike and ped projects versus other projects. We see it when you fund bike ped projects, you make the community better for everyone. You reduce congestion. You ease parking at BART and in our downtown areas. But our citizens have to feel safe first. And it's simple. To make them feel safe, we need improvements to the infrastructure. And doing so requires adequate funding. I urge you to adopt the funding recommendations put forth by Bike East Bay. But in a sense, this isn't really just a matter of funding. It's about what we want for the future. And the answer is already clear. What our cities and what CCTDA itself has put out there as its vision and mandate is to provide sustainable transportation. The answer is already clear. But we need your support to make this a reality now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Micah Pierce, um, and I'm here with Bike Concord and Bike East Bay. I've been a resident of Contra Costa County for most of my life, and I've been commuting by bicycle for the better part of three years in the city of Concord. In the last few weeks, I've seen a considerable increase in the number of bicycle commuters in Concord and on my commute route, which means I've seen many more people bicycling on narrow, uneven, and often blind sidewalks. The sight of other bicycle commuters, cycling enthusiasts out for an evening's exhilaration, and parents taking their children for afternoon rides warms my heart. But the condition for bicycling in Contra Costa's most populous city concerns me deeply. In many streets, pedestrians and bicyclists are forced to share sidewalks that are barely wide enough for two people abreast, let alone a pedestrian and a cyclist. Because our streets have been designed to accommodate cars and nothing else. Wide, multi-lane streets with high speed limits and few pedestrian crossings may accommodate more traffic in and out of our cities and county. But it alienates those who cannot afford a personal vehicle and it dissuades those that would walk and bike the streets of their lovely cities from opportunities to do so. By choosing to prioritize motor motorized transportation over active transportation, we cut off neighborhoods like my own on Clayton Road, 
from accessing resources for outdoor activities such as Lime Ridge open space or the several parks that are short stroll or bike ride from their front doors. The transportation expenditure plan offers a golden opportunity to connect communities with the parks and services that our taxes support, provide a form of equality to the least fortunate in our society in the form of accessible work through cheap means, and make an opportunity to create an environment that fosters healthy lifestyle choices for members of our community, especially the nearly 34% of children currently overweight. All of these things we can do. Along with the strong complete streets requirement that, our sta that your staff and consultants have worked out with Bike East Bay, a large percentage of the bicycle and pedestrian funding category will make sure that the opportunity is not wasted. 15% would be great, but if that is not possible, please push the number as close to that mark as can be done. Do not let this golden opportunity pass us up. Support a better, healthier, and happier community by allocating funds with strong dedication to active transportation. My name is Steve Larson. I'm at 2930 Camino Diablo Road in Byron. And I've lived in East Contra Costa County for 30 years. I've had jobs all over the Bay Area. And so I've seen the roads change over the years. And I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you. Uh, having moved to Antioch in 1986, I've seen at least two lake love bridges. Tonight when I was driving through, five lanes wide, shoulders on the side, railway, congrats, you guys have done a great job. Now is not the time, I mean now is the time to fund projects that will connect these improvements to Tracy and the Central Valley. Having driven the Byron Highway for 18 years, I've seen significant changes in the trucks, trucks, trucks. Tracy has become a distribution hub. It's time for those trucks to be on a high volume road and get the local roads back to where they should be. High volume traffic should be on a high volume road. I'd also like to promote at this time the airport connector, as I see it as a positive for the community of Byron. It'll create local jobs as the airport will likely see growth with better access, both light industrial and air freight. So please keep that in mind when you make your decision. Chair Tatson, commissioners, and members of staff, thank you for the opportunity to comment. My name is Kenji Yamada, and I'm an alternate for Dave Campbell of Bike East Bay on the Expenditure Plan Advisory Committee. I'm also here on behalf of Concord and Central Contra Costa residents who get around our region by bicycle, would like to be able to do so safely and conveniently anywhere in our community, and have formed the organization called Bike Concord to advocate for that goal. A few of them are in the room here tonight, and you've heard from some of them at this microphone. Um, I first want to recognize the openness fairness and hard work of your staff and consultants on this draft TEP, especially Ross Chittenden, Bill Gray, and Matt Todd, who've done a great job ensuring that the input of the various stakeholders in this process has all been recorded, publicly aired, and publicly responded to. I think the comment log concept that they've come up with is a great way to capture this and make sure um, that we know what's being done with our input. Um, the language we've arrived at in the Complete Streets policy through extensive conversations with staff and consultants will go a long way to make sure that the street investments made possible by this measure will create the conditions for transportation that keeps residents healthy, supports local businesses, and reduces maintenance burdens on our infrastructure. I'm here to ask you to lend your support for a robust Complete Streets program throughout Contra Costa County. And as Ross mentioned, um, you'll see the, the results of our conversations with staff and consultants in the next draft that appears before you. Um, our members appeared before you back in October asking for at least 15% of the measure for dedicated bicycle and pedestrian projects as, <clears throat> as distinct from street projects which include the non-motor components of traffic. I understand that this tax has to cover many needs and we are not all going to get quite the level of funding that we might have hoped for. Uh, however, there is a time sensitive need to complete a bikeway network in Contra Costa County. It can't wait another, another 30 years. 5% uh, of the measure would at least cover the most important needs. This is considerably less than 15, but it would be an increase from the 2.6% uh, in the current draft. So I'm asking for your support for that increase. Um, and finally, uh, I'd like to ask if, if you could to find a way so that the method of awarding funds from competitive categories, such as the major streets and complete streets category, uh, incentivizes projects which maximally meet the category standards rather than privileging less than ideal projects based on their location within the county. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, after AJ will be uh, Josh Huber and then Cynthia Armgor. Good evening, Chair and members of the board. 
My name is A.J. Fardella. I'm the chairman of the Pittsburgh Planning Commission. In reference to various comments and suggestions which have been made pertaining to the draft transportation expenditure plan, the draft tech, the City of Pittsburgh offers the following comments. The City of Pittsburgh strongly opposes the specific exclusion of any projects as part of the upcoming sales tax measure. In particular, Pittsburgh believes the James Donlan Extension Project should not be excluded as it has been listed as a route of regional significance for over 20 years. Moreover, this project has been included as a mitigation measure for dozens of developments in Brentwood, Antioch, Oakley, and unincorporated areas of East County. In addition, it should be noted that the City of Pittsburgh is a participant in the East County HCP. The East County HCP has approved and protected so far over 12,000 acres and will preserve and protect over 30,000 acres by the end of the plan. Pittsburgh as the lead agency on this project is committed to the full mitigation of any environmental impacts which the project may create through the HCP process. Finally, Pittsburgh has repeatedly expressed its intention to obtain and dedicate right away on both sides of the roadway to the East Bay Regional Park District. This right of way will be conveyed in fee, making it impossible for access to the roadway by any future developments without the approval of the East Bay Regional Parks. Thus, in effect, guarantees that this project will not be growth inducing. Since the project will not be increasing the number of cars in the region and it will allow for smoother flowing traffic, it will reduce the amount of greenhouse gases emitted in the area. Let me be clear. The James Donlan extension will actually improve air quality in the southern portion of Pittsburgh. Thank you for your consideration to these comments and have a good evening. Thank you. Josh Huber followed by Cynthia Armgor and Brian Corey. Uh, good evening. My name is Josh Huber. I am the policy director with the East Bay Leadership Council. Here this evening on behalf of our CEO, Kristen Connolly, who uh, sits on the EPAC and uh, is sick this evening and asked me to make a couple comments. Uh, the first is to thank all of you, uh, but especially the staff and consultants who have been working on this. Obviously, this has uh, been a long and arduous uh, process, I think it's fair to say, but um, it's, uh, I think it's really commendable to some of the hard work that's gone in, especially by the staff and, and the consultants, and just want to thank them, thank them for all of that. Um, also wanted to let you know that we are um, actually having some conversations uh, outside of even the subgroup uh, efforts to try to figure out with uh, some of our friends in the environmental bike and uh, business community uh, a way to uh, compromise on, on some of these issues and you know, bring you a, a united front for, for your consideration. Um, just a little bit of a preview on some of that from the, just the council's perspective. Um, one is the 680 funding that uh, Ross alluded to earlier. Uh, the minimum of 200, we think 200 million is, is really important. Uh, perhaps moreover, um, East County Connector. Uh, I really appreciate Supervisor Pifo's comments earlier. This is a really important uh, issue in terms of economic development in the East County and also uh, along the northern waterfront uh, in that initiative that uh, Supervisor P uh, Glover, I know you've uh, been a key uh, with as well. So I um, just want to leave you with that. We think it's really important for economic development, uh, both in terms of moving people and moving goods, and I uh, hope you'll continue to consider that as we continue to uh, engage in this process. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, this is the Ungur, followed by Brian Corey and Garrett Evans. Welcome. Hello. Good evening. My name is Cynthia Armour, and I work with Bike East Bay. Um, I rode here from downtown Concord along the Iron Horse Trail, about a 25-minute ride. It was beautiful. Uh, fantastic ride. However, um, had I spent five minutes afterwards on a more common type of street, like Willow Pass or Treat Boulevard or Rumrill, you can trust me when that smile would have been wiped right off my face. Um, so Contra Costa has some great trails, but it's not enough to create walkable, bikeable communities, to create a safe network of bikeways. There's a lot of work to be done, a lot of connections to be made, a lot of investments to commit. And we're working with groups um, in cities across Contra Costa and Richmond, in Orinda, in Concord, in Martinez, with the Delta Peddlers, with a number of different groups who are all asking for this as well. These investments are essential for more efficient and equitable use of our streets. 
and for, and for the good of the economy as well. So I would like to reiterate what Kenji Yamada has already asked, that please make these things possible by allocating at least 5% specifically to bike and ped infrastructure. Thank you very much for your work and have a nice evening. Thank you. Um, to Brian Corey, followed by Garrett Evans and Hurik Anyan McCreary. Good evening, members. Uh, thank you very much for letting me speak. My name is Brian Corey. I live in Concord, and I latched onto the Bike Concord group um, because they shared my interest in wanting a safe place to ride my bicycle. I rode my bicycle down here this evening. I tried to ride my bicycle and just not drive my car in a, by, you know, by myself in a car. I just think it's the wrong thing to do. Um, the meeting that I attended before, a point was made by the chairman that everything that we've done to improve the roadways seem to result in the same um, thing, and that is that we end up with more cars on the road. And as an alternative to that, um, I believe that in not to be arguing with some of the points that were made here, but I believe businesses in our local areas and having community space so that, that the housing uh, supports where people live and their businesses and, is, and to have less travel on the road is very important in planning, which I believe is a vision. And it was also um, spelled out with your graph. It was uh, out of uh, the MTC's input from the 2040 planning. It was one of the priorities that came from the community uh, charts that were formed there too. So thank you very much for considering 5% for your funding. Good evening, Chair, Commission members. Um, Garrett Evans, Assistant City Manager with the City of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh supports the efforts of CCTA in providing cooperative transportation solutions for our community and not excluding any projects under consideration for the TEP. Our Pittsburgh Center of Arts station is under construction and leading to a significant push around the station to build a thriving transit-oriented infill development. In fact, this week I had a developer meet with me to discuss if we would allow six stories or higher near our BART station. Um, one of the projects, as we've heard, is being uh, listed as possible excluded from the TEP is the James Donlin Extension Project. The James Donlin Extension Project has been planned by Pittsburgh for over 25 years, has a certified EIR, and its impacts are specifically covered by the HCP. The James Donlin Extension is a priority project um, with our East County community partners, Antioch, Oakley, Brentwood, and unincorporated Contra Costa County, and is the next priority project in the queue. It will move traffic from the surrounding communities off our congested existing streets. It is estimated that 90% of that traffic using James Donlin Extension will be from other communities, not Pittsburgh where they currently idle and contribute significantly to greenhouse gas emissions in our community. The James Donlin Extension will not avail itself to encourage new development in Pittsburgh. There are no new developments tied to this project. There will only, it will only move traffic more efficiently to their destination. With CCTA's help, the Pittsburgh Center BART Station and James Donlin Extension are creating a better, more livable community in Pittsburgh. We encourage the board not to exclude any projects in the TEP. Thank you for your consideration. Good evening. Uh, my name is Huri Ayanyan McRae. Uh, I am a Concord resident and I'm also a member of Bike Concord. Um, I'm here tonight to support Bikey Space proposal for the transportation expenditure plan. Um, I believe it's important to promote healthier community communities, and I urge you to support uh, Bikey Space proposal as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and good evening to you all. My name is Ron Reagan, and I live in Brentwood, California. I'm a, a member of the Airport Land Use Commission, and I chair the Aviation Advisory Committee. I'm here tonight, though, as a businessman in Brentwood. I've owned and operated my tax practice, which I was able to escape from tonight, um, for the past 37 years, and I've uh, operated it in Brentwood for the last 17 years. And um, I'd like to bring your attention to a, a paragraph that's on your handout here. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take a moment to read it. It says that an objective study has determined 
that a change to the urban limit line is necessary or desirable to, conf to further the economic viability of the East Contra Costa County Airport and either mitigate adverse aviation-related environmental or community impacts attributable to the Buchanan Field. One of the things that <clears throat> we are concerned with in East County, and specifically uh, Brentwood and Oakley in that area, is the 239 project. And uh, my understanding is that the 239 project was introduced in 1959, and if you promise not to do the math, I'll tell you that that's the year I graduated from high school. So I'd like to tell you that we've been very patient in East County with regard to, <laughs> to the 239 project. But specifically what I am concerned about is the growth of and, the, and the, the ability that we have to create jobs in East County. Um, I would like to see if for some reason we can't uh, put, make, make the 239 project a priority. What I would like to see is a priority of the connector from Vasco Road to Armstrong Road that connects to the Byron Airport. And then perhaps even at that point when um, when that connector is completed and maybe even pull it out of the 239 project and make it a standalone project such that we can be begin to develop around the airport and the urban limit line project uh, or uh, paragraph that I just read would be, would be instrumental in that. But we could also depend upon the development around there to even help fund a further extension to the Byron, to the Byron Highway. I know that um, this is a small, small example, but when I first moved to Brentwood, the mayor of Brentwood at that time uh, made it necessary for developers, if you want to develop in our town, you need to build parks, and we've got parks all over, all over Brentwood. Well, I believe that we can make uh, certain provisions and ask developers to cost share in the development of an extension road from Vasco Road to at least to the airport and perhaps even beyond. So I think that it's very important that we take a look at and, and prioritize uh, the need for an extension to the airport such that we can begin to, to create more active use out there, take some of the financial pressure off of Buchanan Airport as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I live in Byron on Camino Diablo, and since the Highway 4 bypass went through and our speed limit was increased, so did the traffic. We became a shortcut to Tracy, which in turn created safety issues for our community and our residents on Camino Diablo, and especially the small downtown area where homes sit close to the road. It has compromised their structure and value of our properties. It's a quality of life issue. 239 Airport Connector Project would take some of the stress off our small county country roads. Please prioritize 239 in your spending plan. Thank you. So my name's Smitty, and um, I'm from a city in the middle eastern part of Contra Costa County called Concord. Um, I'm here to support the Bike East Bay's proposal for 5% um, uh, percentage of the expenditure plan. Um, I've been an advocate in uh, Contra Costa County since, an advocate for bicycling in Contra Costa County since 2001. Um, during that period, I've seen a, a, a large increase of the use of bicycles and a large increase of pedestrians walking to the BART station. Um, infrastructure has not kept up with the increase of use of bicycles in uh, Contra Costa County, so we need to get funding to to increase the infrastructure for bicyclists so that it can be safe for uh, families to go to school and for people like myself to commute to the BART station and go into San Francisco. Thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, the next person to get in line will be Dave Campbell to follow um, Mr. Dugan. Welcome. Yes, I'm Jack Nix. I live on Camino Diablo in Byron, and that's uh, what I wanted to speak to add to what Mrs. Manasian had to say. Camino Diablo is become a racetrack. It is the unintended consequences of the Highway 4 bypass, and it's a shortcut between Vasco Road and the Byron Highway, and it's a north-south <laughs> corridor uh, with trucks and uh, an enormous volume of traffic. Uh, one study had 19,000 vehicles a day 
on Camino Diablo, and this is a horse and buggy road, a country road, uh, with no soft shoulders or anything like that. So it's an issue of safety because they raised the speed limit. Between May and May of last year, there were 15 accidents between downtown Byron and the irrigation canal, including a couple big rigs. And three times they had to medevac people out of there. And I tell the bicycle people, don't ride on Camino Diablo. You take your life in your hands. And there's children that walk every day down that road to school. And the traffic is unbelievable. <coughs> so I would beg you to prioritize the 239 airport connector with uh, Armstrong Road uh, to relieve some of the volume of traffic on that. And I think if you fund that, it's going to be good. There, other people are going to talk about the advantages of that, but just for the safety of the people who live on Camino Diablo. It's unsafe for us to pull out of our driveways or to slow down and turn to, to try and turn into our driveways. So I'd urge you, please prioritize the 239 connector. And thank you for my chance to speak. Thank you. Uh, Sean Dugan and then Dave Campbell and Patricia Mantelli Bristow. Good evening. My name is Sean Dugan. I'm the Trails Development Program Manager at the East Bay Regional Park District. Thanks for allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, first, I do want to thank uh, this board for uh, the continued investment in bikes and ped oh, since 2004. The Measure J funding that's currently allocated for this program has allowed us to leverage our Measure WW funding, Measure CC funding, and do projects that we would otherwise not have been able to do. Um, the, and, it, and it's good because there's about 100 miles of trail in this county and about 100 more proposed. And it's a lot of it's approaching 30 years old, and uh, we, we definitely support the, uh, the, the strong language in this category. Uh, but I do have uh, a problem with the amount. And I, and I wouldn't call it a problem. I think it's an opportunity. Uh, a lot's changed since 2004. And um, I have a brochure that I, I, I gave to the clerk here um, that identifies about $129 million worth of trails projects that we've identified that link transit-oriented developments, that link employment centers, that uh, connect priority development areas, schools, hospitals, as well as provide overcrossings over major roads that otherwise are being crossed at grade, which causes congestion, as you all know. Um, Currently, the 2.6% that's allocated uh, for this category will cover just under half of that amount that we've identified. 4% um, gets us 93.5 million, and 5% would be 116 million. So it's still not quite funding it, but we support the 5% that uh, you've heard about tonight. I'll try to keep this short, and I like numbers too. We have about 20 trail counters throughout this county. And those counters are on the Contra Costa Canal Trail, the Iron Horse Trail, the Delta De Anza Trail, San Francisco Bay Trail, and others. Those counters, since 2011, have shown a 39% increase in usage. And I've already provided this, this comment. I'm also a member of the EPAC. Um, that's an average of 2 million users per year. And I know you know this, but that's twice the population of Contra Costa County. I don't know if that's really relevant, but it just gives you an idea of uh, how many people that really is. Um, counters in the urban areas, in the rural areas, in West County, in East County, they sh certain counters in there, at least two of them in, in those counties, I'm sorry, in those uh, subregions, show peak hours of use on those trails that mirror the commute hours on our freeways and in our BART system uh, between nine or seven and nine and four and six in the evening. And that's also on here. Um, I, I thank you again for your investment in this category. I think it could go up to 5%. I'm, I'm pushing for that. And um, I, I will just close by saying that I think as a voter myself, when I hear that my transportation dollars are going towards pothole repair, it's not as exciting to me. When I can show that there's a project happening in my backyard, I can walk to school, my kids can walk to school, I'm, I'm advocating for balance here. I think that we should, we should seek balance and not focus only on our roads, take care of our infrastructure, of our bikes and ped network, as well as, as well as our others. Thanks for your time. Don't go away. I have a question, Mr. Chair. When you talk about 2 million, your counters have 2 million, is that 2 million people or 2 million trips? The counters count the break in the beam, and it's an average of 2 million per year. Two million uh, trips. Two million, two million breaks in that beam. Okay, and, and that's fine. And I they just undercount as well. 
Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dave Campbell, Advocacy Director with the Bank East Bay. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. You heard from representatives of our Army, actually, uh, in support of 5% for Bike Ped and a strong Complete Streets program. It's an Army that's ready to hit the campaign trail and get the voters to support a much-needed increase in transportation funding in Contra Costa County. If we can come to an agreement on a plan, and based on the comments tonight, we still have some work to do. Uh, in the spirit of getting us all closer together, I do want to lend Bike East Bay support to your attachment B, the letter from Bay Area Council, East Bay Leadership Council, uh, Building Industry Association, where they say they would like to see strong guidelines incorporated into the major funding categories. We absolutely support that as well. I think the voters deserve that. These flexible categories that have a corridor approach, and I include major streets and complete streets in there, uh, we need to make sure we select the best project. So we support the strong guidelines, strong performance measures to make sure we get the voters the best projects. And of all the conversations I've heard to date, I think that's the one thing that I've heard the most agreement on. And I would encourage staff, your hardworking staff, who I do want to thank for their efforts, if we could see some of those performance measures and goals a lot sooner, I think it will get us to the finish line sooner. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Patty Mantelli Bristow, and I want to thank you for your time, first of all, board members. It's nice to see some familiar faces, Federal and Bob. Nice to see you. I am from a farming family that started farming asparagus in East Contra Costa County in 1916. We are still growing asparagus, and we are still paying our taxes for county, for the Contra Costa County transportation. My father taught me many, many years ago, if you want to make a difference, Patty, get involved. So I, for the past year, have been on the Contra Costa Transportation Authority Citizens Advisory Committee. And the reason I got on the committee is because I really, really am worried about State Route 239. I live on Camino Diablo Road in Byron, and it was my foundation and, and my well that were falling apart because of the trucks that were passing on it. Our, super bar, our Board of Supervisors, we started two years ago, and on November 10th of last year, our County Board of Supervisors passed an ordinance taking the trucks off the road. Those, those trucks, belong on State Route 239, which, as Ron said, has been on the books since 1959. We pay our taxes. We've been here long enough. We need our roads, and we need them as a priority, please. The second thing I want to talk about is BART. Again, my parents paid into BART. My grandparents paid into BART. In the early 1960s, um, when, well, BART was started, was thought of in 1949. In the early 1960s, when I was still at Liberty High School, my best friend Sally's grandfather, Supervisor Joe Silva, was the supervisor that made BART happen. We deserve our BART station, too, in Brentwood and Byron. Thank you for your time. Hi. Uh, thank you for all you do. My name is Ron Schmidt. I'm pastor of St. Anne Church in Byron. I've been there 21 years. Um, I live in Byron on uh, Hallway, 3959 Hallway. Uh, I'm also a member of the Byron Municipal Advisory Committee. And I came to speak in favor of the 239 project. Uh, I think it's essential for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we're drowning in traffic in, in our uh, community. Uh, the volume of traffic going to uh, Tracy and, and other parts unknown uh, pass through Byron. 
Uh, it's hard to get out of your driveway in the morning and in the evening. Uh, it's killing uh, the economics of the community. It's also dangerous. Uh, there are many uh, children who live in a trailer park near us who are constantly walking along the Byron Highway, and I cringe every time I see them walking along there because of the volume of traffic and the speed that's going along there. We need to uh, uh, develop 239 in order to alleviate some of the traffic, but also it will provide some economic development. The three churches in our area are taking care of the poverty in the area, and we it's kind of been a hidden thing for a long time that the uh, the poverty in East County has been kind of not seen because it's in suburbia or in, in a rural area. But uh, about every week, uh, the ecumenical food pantry in our area is uh, f feeding over 150 families in uh, Byron, in Discovery Bay, in uh, Bethel Island, and in uh, the Clayton Trailer Park. Uh, there is a need for economic development, and the airport connector, I think, is also key for that. And, and in many ways, Byron and that part of the county has been neglected and forgotten. Uh, if you drive down Main Street in Byron, it looks like a blighted neighborhood. And we need to be able to have some attention put in that part of the county. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chairman Tazen and members of the um, of the commission. My name is Tony Tiscarino. I am a, a member of uh, the Anya City Council. I'm also a member of Transplan, Ecrafa, and State Route uh, for uh, Bypass. And I'm here uh, to support uh, um, the statements that uh, Supervisor uh, Mary People had addressed with you. I think it's important that we uh, continue to do the good work that you've done in East County. Uh, there's a lot of good things that happen. You know, traffic is uh, starting to get a little bit better out there. But we, you know, being the heart of uh, of the East County and Antioch, we do see the congestion out there, and, and we know there's a lot of work, and it's going to go uh, all the way down to to the Byron area. So I am in support of extending uh, 239, and we also are supportive of uh, ex uh, keeping the project uh, as far as uh, the James Nolan project going. Uh, but what I'm here to talk about is. Uh, you know, given any given day, uh, we are, I believe, the second largest uh, city in the county of Antioch, over 108,000 uh, members out there, uh, citizens. And uh, we as a city council did some prioritizing. And one of the things that we're looking at uh, with, uh, with our transportation is, you know, our, our road repairs and street repairs. But we're also interested in, in, in keeping uh, the conversation open on, on the ferry system out there. Uh, we've had that uh, conversation. I know it's in the plan here. I, I was noticing on your bar chart that it didn't seem like it was a priority, but uh, I think it is a priority. Uh, Antioch is a gateway to the Delta. It's a hub. It would bring in economic development. It would bring in a lot of good things to, this, to the surrounding cities out there. So I'm really going to advocate, and we're going to continue to advocate the very system out there. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Fred Doolittle and Michael Vecchio and, and Joel DeValcourt. Good evening. Uh, my name is Fred Doolittle. I'm a resident of Dan Danville, California, and um, I think there's one theme that I've heard almost universally tonight, and that is traffic congestion. And um, how, how do we alleviate traffic and congestion? What works? Do widening roads or adding a left turn lane here or there really work? No, it really doesn't. You have to get volume. And um, I have a little quiz for you. What happened in, the, in New York City when they converted, uh, what happened to the car traffic when they converted um, car, a car lane to protected bike lanes that are safe and efficient? The cars, did they slow down or speed up because the traffic was pushed into the fewer lanes? They sped up because bikes are smaller than cars. How many bikes can fit in one car parking space? Nine. Maybe 10. Exactly. Bikes are a mechanism, and they have been used effectively around the world to, um, to alleviate congestion and traffic and get more people through a built-up area. It's also a quality of life issue. It's also a, a democracy and economic issue. They're serious transportation. They uh, allow people to get exercise, get to work, 
and um, and they're recreational. So I'm uh, also offering my support for five uh, percent. Furthermore, we have this um, these railway systems, including BART, which can move people at a grand total of twenty cents per mile per passenger mile. That's nearly one third what an automobile can do. Far more efficient, but that thing, once parking's filled up, um, it runs empty most of the day. How do we get people to BART around the clock? By protected, safe, efficient bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And as folks have said, <coughs> why don't more people use it? They do in places uh, around the world and around the United States um, where the facilities and infrastructure is high quality. Um, and I also heard, I heard a couple comments about, oh, the, and the bicycle is two or whatever. It, it, when you really look at the numbers, it's a very efficient, effective form of spending dollars to get uh, increased transportation capacity. Um, and it's a win-win. It's not a win-lose. What happened to the business foot traffic on Valencia Street in San Francisco when they removed a car lane and put in bike lanes? business foot traffic went up. So it, it is a win-win-win. I encourage you to support this, uh, this proposal. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, Michael Vecchio and then Joel DeValcourt, followed by Diane McNair. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Vecchio. I'm a resident of Walnut Creek and a member of Bike Walnut Creek. I have some handouts here. I'm not sure. You just give them to staff. If they just give them to you and you just pass them around. Um, some of the information that I think um, Bike East Bay had prepared indicated how over the last five years or so, census data was pretty clear that Contra Costa County was, was pretty flat in the, in the bike usage, though some other counties were increasing. Um, I sort of just coincidentally had, um, in preparation for the meeting tonight, looked at some of the uh, five census tracts around Concord BART Station and the Walla Creek BART Station, and that's what's in the handout that you'll be getting. Um, it really shows pretty clear over the last five years that the bicycle usage has decreased in those census tracts around the BART station. You'll also see in the handout that it shows um, the commute to work trips for uh, bikes, cars, BART, and as well as walking. And you'll see the various percentages and in the increases um, in BART, for example. But you'll see really um, the decrease in all, and for the five census tracts, decrease in, in bike use. So that's really a clear indication, that at least over the last five years, that the bike use has decreased, which means funding has decreased, infrastructure has, has not kept pace with the demand, and people are really clamoring to use their bikes in safe and efficient, as a safe and efficient way to get to work. So um, I think it's a clear indication that the funding that's proposed for the, the Measure J plan really needs to be increased dramatically to be able to get what, what one of the, achieve one of the goals that you want to achieve, which is increasing bike traffic, and when you do that, you'll decrease some of the auto traffic on the roads at the same time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Joel, Joel DeValcourt, Diane McNair, and Marianne Roberts. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you, and thank you, staff, as well, for, for moving this forward. Um, thank you for this opportunity tonight. Um, I think this is a momentous evening. We might not all see it that way. It's contentious, perhaps. Um, but there's expanding public dialogue in our county right now, and that's a good thing. Um, and it's certainly not going to stop tonight. This is going to go on for the next couple months. And it really speaks to the interconnection of these issues. It speaks to the diversity of the county. We're a, a county of subregions. Um, and we also live in a different time than 1998. We live in a different time than 2004. And now's the time that we have to make the right kind of smart decisions. We're asking people to put up $2.3 billion um, of tax money over the next 30 years. We're not asking them to do it for the first time. We're asking them to do it for the third time. And these have to meet state laws. They have to reduce congestion so that voters are happy. And we have a lot of needs not only in each part of the county, but from each interest group. You have a 29-member EPAC group that can't come to a decision on what we need. And that, that I think, speaks to some sense of the complexity of these issues and also um, that we, we might not all be happy, and, th and that might be all right. Um, speaking to some things tonight, it's, it's plainly false to assume that a county transportation measure can't require local jurisdictions to conform to standards that voters have strongly supported for decades. Indeed, CCTA has done this since 1998 with the Growth Management Program, and it reaffirmed and it strengthened those in 2004. There's no legal basis for the claims that regional money nor county money should directly or indirectly fund poorly performing projects. 
Local jurisdictions are welcome to try funding controversial projects through local initiatives. That's fine. Why should county as a whole make these particular decisions at this time? There are $2.3 billion at stake. People all over the county have a voice, and 2016 is not the status quo, which is why, among many other tools, voters have approved time and again. We hope to invest in projects that enhance our existing system, close loopholes that allow sprawl, invest in transit, walking, biking, and corridor projects, which include highway investments as well, that reduce congestion, protect our farms and open space, create good jobs, and enhance incentives to direct growth to the right places. These are all things that voters in Contra Costa have already supported, and the current draft falls short of meeting these and enhancing them. And this is why so many EPAC members and Contra Costa voters are proposing to have performance measures that give voters a guarantee that their money is well spent to meet the public good, not putting any of the sub-regions at a disadvantage. It, means a bit, it seems a bit disingenuous that some think that previous tax dollars have not served the entire county. This would appear to condemn previous initiatives and call to question Highway 4 widening, BART extensions in the previous tax measures, as well as other things that I think have perhaps not as well served East County as we'd like them to, uh, but have certainly been voted twice in by voters, and those discussions have happened in the past. It only seems fair that each subregion gets a corridor allotment that's equitable and that we can then let them wrestle out what are the best performing projects. Currently, East County has three corridor projects. All the others have one, none of which have any proposed final project, totaling more than any of the other subregions, twice of the West County. So it seems fair to see which one of those three works best. Is it a BART extension? Is it alleviating traffic through the East County corridor? Is it doing goods movement by rail, which I think is a great idea, and we have an existing rail system. So we have a lot of projects on the table, and we need to make smart decisions with an additional tax increment that will put all of the voters at Contra Costa in a position to make the right decisions. And we may have a long way to go. We might have a, a few more months, but I think we have smart minds in this room. We have smart minds who are voters, and I think we can make the right decisions. So thank you very much. I'm not used to public speaking. I'm Diane McNair. I'm an Antioch resident. I support Bike East Bay's proposal for the TEP. Um, I didn't plan on speaking, um, but um, when I, uh, I'm relatively new to cycling as my primary means of transportation. And when I inquire about safe routes to get from here to there, and I'm told there aren't any, um, then I'd rather stand here and be nervous about speaking and hopefully find safe routes rather than taking my life in my hands to get from here to there. Thanks. You did great. We look forward to hearing from you again. Uh, Marianne Roberts and uh, Elena. Hi, everyone. I'm Marianne Roberts, a uh, brand new resident of Concord. Yay, Concord. <laughs> Um, I'm here with Bike Concord and uh, support Bike East Bay's proposals for the TEP. I'm a commuting and recreational cyclist for the past 15 years. I'm not new to cycling. Um, in Oakland and San Francisco is where I've done most of my riding. And uh, we've seen a lot of gains there and growth in recent years, which is really exciting. Um, I support safe and accessible bike and pedestrian pathways and infrastructure everywhere. Um, especially where we bike. My partner Arash and I, where are you babe? Wave, hi. <laughs> My partner Arash and I um, bike with our kids who are six and nine. We just moved to Concord a month ago and we find it much more challenging to bike with our kids on busy streets due to the lack of bike lanes. Or we'll pick up a bike lane and then it'll drop off for a couple of blocks and we'll have to jump on the sidewalk. Um, we take back roads and residential streets, but it's tough when we have to cross or ride along a major corridor like Bancroft, Oak Grove, or Treat Boulevard. You can kind of guess where we live. Uh, we manage, and it can get a little hectic. You can see me in the front, Arash in the back, the kids between us, a lot of, you know, stay to the right, focus, keep your, you know, eye on my wheel line, and uh, they do great. But it can be a little scary sometimes. Uh, we're doing our part to raise the next generation to re help reduce automotive traffic and congestion in the community, but we really need your help. We support Bike East Bay's proposals, uh, TEP proposal, and in particular allocating at least 5% of the 
for bike and pedestrian infrastructure that will make our roads safer for families and commuters. Thank you so much for your listening, patience, time, and support. Thank you. Uh, Elena Miyakashiva. Hello, I'm Elena Miyakashiva. I am, uh, today I just found out is I've been riding a bicycle for five years since being a kid, anyway. Um, <laughs> I am a resident and middle school teacher here in Concord. I bike to work and my students walk, bike, skateboard, scooter, and bus to school. Please make it safer for us. We had a student killed just last year by a vehicle, and I would like to know that my students will make it to school every day. Please, honestly, even those ones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> also, I really would like to be able to BART to Brentwood. I know it's been, I know it's been, been planned forever. That would be awesome. Um, anyway, I am here to support uh, bike East Bays and Bike Concord's 5% funding proposal for a bike pedestrian for the bike pedestrian category. I am one of the many Bike Concord peers. If we could just have a stand. We've heard from a number of you. We, like, uh, yeah. We're all still here. Uh, we're serious. Please, please give us the 5%. Thank you. Thank you. Right. You're in unincorporated Contra yeah, Costa, Costa County. County. Right, right. And believe me, it's a Walnut Creek address. We're, we're we fought power. that battle. I wish it was still Pleasant right. Hill. 29.99. Anyway, thank you very much for your comments. So I have one speaker card left from Stephen Smith. So if anyone else would like to speak on this item, this is your last chance to fill out a speaker slip for items 1.2 or 1.3. Welcome. Steve Smith, well known to most of you. I realized somewhat belatedly that a paragraph that I had prepared for the next agenda item is better placed here. With regard to the issue of State Route 239, an essential part of Brentwood's efforts to improve our jobs housing balance involves going past our current status as a transportation cul-de-sac. State Route 239 is an essential part of this program for us. It is also key to improve freight movement in East County, alleviation of the pressures on the Altamont Pass, and our best chance of an extended multimodal transit corridor to add to the Bay Area Transit Network. The only east west al east west well, that's pretty accurate, actually, east-west alternative to State Route 239 is State Route 4. I cannot see the expansion of this route between Discovery Bay and Stockton as ever being feasible, either financially or ecologically. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other speaker slips? Great. Then if not, I will bring it back to the authority for comments on items 1.2 and 1.3. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about the percentage allocated to bicycles, the particular uh, projects proposed for East County, a little bit about BART. Um, but if I could ask Ross one question just to grind. So my recollection is that when we started this allocation of money process in August of last year, we gave a preliminary allocation of the $2.3 billion to each of the four subregions. They came back with a series of project and program recommendations, and that formed the original. And then that's been amended to some extent by the money that was put in as a draft for the BART cars, and to some extent for this community development investment program. But um, other than that, do the allocations continue to represent the priorities of each of the four RTPCs or not? Well, my, my judgment would be generally yes. Um, certainly, um, um, there was a, a great display yesterday in the Board of Supervisors packet that they probably should have put in as well. That was a side-by-side -side comparison of the uh, uh, RTPC proposals and, and what we had in the draft. Um, certainly, the, uh, on a percentage basis, the uh, funding for seniors and, and people with disabilities took the largest percentage uh, reduction based on what the RTPCs recommended. and. I think that's one we'll have to address. Um, certainly um, one that we've discussed here quite a bit is the return to source where there was a 
25 to 30 percent request and this version currently um, talks about 23 percent. I think the biggest uh, point, and I think it's something you mentioned in the previous meeting, is we didn't ask the RTPCs to opine on any of the policy matters. So, so that's happening uh, uh, as they review the draft now. So um, general alignment, yes. Um, uh, new categories with the uh, technology and the community development incentive program. Um, and then, you know, some relatively proportional reduction to fund the categories that, that you mentioned, the BART and the that CDI program. And could you just remind us that when we did our most recent round of polling, what did the residents tell us were the things that were most important to them? Yes, the uh, the, the three uh, highest areas that, that uh, came back through the polling, um, and this was back in February 2014, um, it was fix our infrastructure, so potholes and taking care of our existing infrastructure. It's uh, BART, access to BART, better BART, uh, uh, more capacity on BART. And then uh, we, we coined, uh, we combined a number of things into a term we're using traffic smoothing. People are tired of sitting in their cars when they're not moving at all or not moving quickly. So that's both combination of congestion on the highway and then um, on our arterials where we don't have uh, uh, the operation sync very well. So you're sitting at red lights often. So it's the traffic smoothing on highways and then better traffic flow on our local roads. Great, thank you. And I do, I know some of the speakers are leaving and getting late, but I just wanted to thank everyone who took the time to come out this evening to speak. It's very much appreciated to hear so many folks um, come out and talk to us and tell us what your impressions are. And now I'd like to get comments from authority members. Ch Chair Tanson, if, yes. you, if, you if you don't mind, um, what would be helpful if, uh, to get the feedback, maybe to break it down a little bit? Um, one of the, uh, I, I should have said this earlier, the, one of the early versions, earliest version of the TEP went out, with, went out without the preface in it, and then we added that and included it in your packet. So. I think when we get the comments, that's one where we'd really like to um, get your, your understanding if we hit that right, because when some of the speakers talk about performance measures, et cetera, they're looking at the criteria and the goals outlined in that to be the basis for some of the criteria. So if we could comment on that first and then maybe comment on uh, more general on some of the funding categories. Okay, so comments on the preface. Commissioner Abelson. Um, yeah, number seven under sales tax augmentation. Um, there's some wording uh, in it. One, one point two dash five. Sorry. Right. Excuse me. Um, it has some really awkward uh, wording that normally isn't used in in discussing accessibility, uh, and it's at the end of the sentence. First of all, the sentence goes on and talks about promoting this topic is promoting accessible transportation, but then later on it says appropriate to their specific condition for access to the community. That doesn't really add anything and it's kind of doesn't even sound right English-wise to me. And um, it isn't just to the community, uh, it's period. It, in other words, it's, it doesn't, it's not a, based on where you want to go, it's based on the disability. So if the sentence ended um, after the word disabilities, it seems to me it would be complete. Okay, um, thank and you. that's a wording yeah, that's, thing. I think that's a good All right. That's my only comment. Okay, and, and I just want to say, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how we evaluate projects and programs, and it struck me that we put a lot of time into essentially the first paragraph that had the, the three points of what we're intending to do here and then the goals. And I would just toss out that one way to think about whether a project or program achieves our purpose is, is it consistent and does it, you know, achieve the, help achieve the goals and preserve and enhance the quality of life of local communities, et cetera. Because if we said those are our overarching thoughts, then that ought to be the guide, at least to me, the basis on which we evaluate specific options. With regards to the 15 things listed below that, my initial reaction is that's too many. That is not an uh, elevator speech. Um, and, and the preface, in my view, needs to be something that's sort of more succinct. So even if it's 
keeping the 15 but trying to summarize into some four or five higher level categories with some subpoints, I think that would help. I have a hard time reading through this and having any sense of what I've read by the time I got through number 15. Maybe that's my age, but. And some of these don't even include the critical points within, for example, under uh, the uh, disability stuff, that the main point is to provide transportation. Okay. So, and it's not there, I think. Well, Where? No, it says to promote it. Okay. Provide. So you're saying provide. provide. Okay. Provide is the word it, 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 so Bill and I were just chatting. If if everyone yeah. agrees with the chair's comments, we could take that back and kind of distill that and bring it Providing back next week if you that. if you like that approach. Yes. Yeah. Too many. Okay. So I heard one other too many. Commissioner Arnrich. Yeah, I, I was just going to reinforce that that I also think the RTCPs are trying to also comment on that, and if you. Um, we were talking about, you know, when you, we've all worked on uh, an ordinance or something. We have all the attorneys in the room. We're absolutely guaranteed we know what it says. Three years later, you pull it out without remembering what you did and you read it. And it doesn't say what you thought because you read into it all of this. There are things in there that have nothing to do with our organization or what we do, not even in a, in a, in a high ethical standard. Uh, uh, the RTCPs are looking at it, but, w but we, need to, we need a good editor who um, is not emotionally involved all of these, just says, this is what our agency is, this is what we do, and within our growth management principles, write it so it's clear and concise. There are things in there, if you read it as a standalone, you're going, what? It, it has absolutely nothing to do with what we're doing. And that's going to get a side bite. It's, it's going to be as, as diverse as what we heard tonight um, from people and what we're hearing on a daily basis that we need to be a little bit more focused. And that's the point of getting that input is to focus. So I hope we really come out with a cleaner, simpler um, version. Commissioner Romick. I, I, I agree with that also. And I'm also looking at the six goals that we have listed. And we are, this is a transportation um, tax that we're looking to do here. And I think they should be in order of importance as they relate to transportation as opposed to uh, promoting environmental sustainability, uh, expand safe. Well, I mean, just go through this process and rearrange it all so the top items on our goal list are related to transportation. And as we get further away from transportation, they're further way down in the goal in a list of, uh, of how they're listed. Um, well, you know, I, I think I disagree with most of my colleagues here that if I were the if I were the czar of this whole thing, you know, I would, I, I would come up with a plan where our transportation funding would primarily support our sustainability goals. And um, I think that, you know, a lot of the advocates we've heard from, you know, are coming from there, but, you know, the other half of them aren't. And, um, but from a practical standpoint, I realize that in the, in the end, at the end of the day, that um, we've got to we've got to get the voters' support on this, or nobody's going to get anything. So that's that's way up there, and we also need to secure support from advocacy groups, or they're going to oppose it, and it'll it'll be a problem. Also, um, the other thing that I see, and this came up when uh, when we talked about it at WICTAC, is that it strikes me that there's a huge amount of overlap in these various categories. And you could take any one category and there are probably a half a dozen other categories that that describe programs that could that could utilize the same funding. I mean pull one out like, you know, tr transportation for people with disabilities or whatever that category is. You know, any if if you adopt performance standards or even without performance standards, just complying with the law, you know, the ADA and the building codes and other things, um, every time you build something new, you're going to have to build into it accessibility. Uh, you're going to have to build it to accessible standards. And so, you know, having a separate category for that, um, I mean, I think that's fine, but it's just an example of where there's a huge amount of overlap. And, and uh, when we discussed this at WICTAC, 
you know, people are talking about, well, I want to pull out of this category and put over here, I want to create a new category. And I, I was the only one at WICTAC that voted against it because, you know, I just thought at the end of the day, you know, we need to maintain flexibility. And um, I, I think that's really important. Um, and try, trying to design a program that's built around very specific programs and end uses is, is, is uh, I think it's just it's confusing, and it's going to continue to be. So, so I could just, for my own edification, ask you a follow-on question. Um, so would you advocate, let's say, for example, fewer categories of expenditure but with more broad, broader language or – more specific I, language for whatever categories I think the categories need to do two things. They need to attract the voter support you need, and they need to uh, minimize uh, potential, you know, objections from advocacy groups. I think whatever makes the voters happy and makes those groups happy, that's, that's what we want to do. But, but we want to build enough flexibility into it so that, um, so that, 20 years from now, when everything's changed, uh, we can do what we have to do with the money, and you know we won't be we won't be stuck with, you know, building buggy trails or something like that. Commissioner Taylor, yeah, Commissioner uh, Durant. I'd like to start out with say I'd like to be perfectly clear <laughs> on um, how we um, really address these issues because they are not perfectly clear. Uh, I think every, every uh, group out there has a point, and I think the flexibility of listening, but then the combination of how we put it all together uh, will be pretty complex, but it also has to be clear to the voting public. We have to make sure that what we say People are going to understand how we phrase it, the whole scene. So I totally agree. Break it down in the sense of lower, don't cross-reference. Uh, we need to um, really put it in a concise package. You make it too large, people won't read it, won't understand it, particularly me. Uh, I loved you uh, going through all this, Ross, but by the time you finished... <laughs> I forgot what you started with, and that's not a slam to you, but I think that affected everybody. So we need to be, we need to bring it down, but, but also be clear in what we're saying. Thank you, Commissioner Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let, let me start by perhaps shocking uh, Commissioner Butt. Um, I agree with you on two, two points you raised. The, the first is that the transportation funding um, that we're looking at should support our sustainability goals. The big question is how. Um, so I don't think that there's any disagreement, at least from my perception of this group, that that is something that we should be striving for. Um, and, and in terms of how we talk about it, in terms of the, the, the goals, I think it, it needs to be incorporated in the goals. But as, as, a, as a, a broad statement, I think all of us want um, better goods movement, more efficient transportation system, better people movement, things that reduce friction and reduce um, greenhouse gases, uh, but, but also, you know, fundamentally make it easier and safer for people to get to work and to play and, and to do it on a variety of modes of transportation or with a variety of modes of transportation. Um, the second thing is, is that I do agree that there is a huge overlap in the categories, which I find frustrating and confusing. <laughs> Um, for example, and I've, I've said this in prior meetings, but I want to reiterate it. I don't know what the magic is to 5% um, with respect to pedestrian and bike and trail facilities or how we got to the notion that that magic number means something, particularly in the universe where, where those same infrastructure improvements can also be and, frankly, are also incorporated in what our local cities do with respect to their streets today. Um, you know, our, our, our Complete Streets program always incorporates pedestrian, bicycle, and trail facilities wherever there are trails, but certainly pedestrian and bike facilities where there aren't. And so the real question for me becomes whether the, the notion that 5% that is somehow in a, 
it, it's separated from what we do with the rest of our street improvements on a local level. Um, I also recognize that there are cities that do better at this and that there are cities that do worse at it. Um, and so there's, there's a part of me that thinks that, that rather than have a sort of dialed in, locked in, line in the sand on 5% for a categorical countywide pedestrian, bicycle, and trail facility program, that maybe we're looking at it the wrong way. Maybe what we want to be doing is, is allocating portions of major streets and complete streets grants and local street and maintenance improvements in ways that, that make those kinds of dollars available to cities who are willing to invest in those ways. Um, because I, 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 let me just be really sort of blunt in this. If we put more money into this as a category, and as much as I love Concord, if all of the money goes to Concord because many of you, most of you who spoke on this are from Concord, I got a problem. My city does really well in this category. Why do I want to fund Concord doing it when they haven't so far to the same extent, if that's in fact true, right? Um, so, so I think we, we kind of have to get past the, the line in the sand thing. Those of you who were here last time heard me say it. We're, we're at the point in this process where, where we need to get past arbitrary lines, define what it is we're trying to achieve by them, and work toward making sure um, that, that we can fundamentally achieve what we're looking for. Um, and, and, and I 100% support, um, you know, doing all of the good things that we're talking about. I think bike lanes are great things. As I said, we've done in, in Pleasant Hill, we've done a great job adding them where we can. Um, we made a huge effort and investment in doing it on Buskirk Avenue when we did that nine, eight, what was it, $9 million, $10 million project. Um, and, and so I think there are, there are ways, and, and I'll try to keep this brief, but, but so fundamentally I think part of this is that we're trying to slice the pie into too many small buckets and not trusting that, that, that on a local level the local jurisdictions will do the, the right thing for the, for the more regional infrastructure system. Um, and, and so the big question for me would really come down to as we sort of futz with the percentages, right, if we're going to we're going to add to pedestrian, bike, and trail facilities. Where does it come from? Whose ox get gored, gets gored? Do we take it from local streets and maintenance improvements, which means that you might actually end up with fewer bicycle lanes and pedestrian facilities being funded from that particular bucket? I don't know that that's the better societal answer, um, but, but I think we need to get to the specifics of those and not just sort of staking territory on, on percentages, but otherwise... Um, conceptually, I, I agree with those two those two points you raised. Great, thank you, Commissioner Hudson. Yeah, Hudson. yeah I don't want to get away from the, the the preface, the initial draft. I think that's what you're on. I think everything that we need to say is in there. I just don't to echo what you've heard before. I think you need to go back and uh, this is usually the point. I dump it all on Don and say whatever you tell me. Yeah. I mean, in between David and Don, they they wordsmith. Uh, and it, but it comes out right, so I mean, why fool with it? Uh, after that, uh, the comments on preface, I'd gladly jump into this, but I'd rather stay with the preface until we finish it. Are there any other comments on preface before we then move on to the Commissioner Glover? Thank you. I think that this is a good job and a great first start, but uh, there's some you heard a lot of comments tonight that really talked loudly about uh, routes of significance and 239 was brought up on many occasions from most speakers that spoke and so I just want to make sure that, that, that we've heard that and that we take a close look at that as we go forward because it's key to trying to garner the support that we're going to need from that region. It's, it's going to be key and very important as well as the fact you know we we have a cat all the categories here has some tie to economic development, but not directly. And an initiative that, that the Board of Supervisors has out there now is the Northern Waterfront. And we need to find a way, if it's incorporated in here somewhere, it doesn't stand out to me. And I think that we need to make sure that, that we're looking at that as a great opportunity, not for any particular region in the county, but the county as a whole. So those are two things that I'm very concerned about and that we need to make sure that they're in here somewhere because to be able to go out and generate the type of um, 
excitement around this measure, I got to have some tools to work with. Well, and since this is a, a measure where we're asking people to pay on top of what they're already paying, and I, you, you can just love people who wordsmith things, but of that, those five goals or six goals, however we end up, I would start with the word enhance, colon, efficient, safe, and reliable movement, growth, uh, manage growth, enhance the management of growth, enhance, safe, convenient, and exportable. The way it's written now, it sounds like we either haven't done anything or we're going to just start doing it. And, and in order to, because that's going to be one of the criticisms is we're asking for money on top of what we're already have asked for and have done well. But uh, again, to make this uh, grab the voter, they need to see that it's going to be more than what we've done. And, and I know, you know, words get boring, but I always think the word enhance is, you know, and you can come up with another one, but people got to see that they're getting more than what they're already paying for. Why don't we move on? Or did you have another comment just, on the preface? Yeah, I just, it's very simple. Um, when when um, staff came to WICTEC originally, we they talked about regional balance, <laughs> and I believe it may have happened with all the groups. But when I get to this document, it's gone. Or, you know, it's not here. So if we could add the words regionally balanced, perhaps okay. in the first sentence or wherever somebody thinks it's appropriate, so that people throughout the county realize that there's regional balance going on, um, that, that would, I think, okay. be helpful. Thank you. And Commissioner Simmons and then Commissioner Glover. Yeah, yeah. Chair Tatson, I may take your initial suggestion a step too far. Okay. But the first six lines could easily be changed to that the augmentation is intended to provide a safe, <coughs> efficient, and reliable uh, transportation Enhanced network. Through. Safety. Enhance is fine. <laughs> but um, I think the notion there is you want a tagline that you can talk to the voters about. It's got to be right at the front. And this is getting right into the weeds right away in that introductory paragraph. So that's just a suggestion for I thinking see. about it. Absolutely thank right. you. Commissioner Glover. Uh, thank you. I also want to, to mention that there was some dialogue that took place earlier on, in particular from uh, Supervisor PFO, who spoke of the urban limit line and the discussion that took place at the Board of uh, Supervisors. Next, oh, is that? Next agenda item. Okay. Hold okay. your okay. <laughs> okay. We'll get there. Okay. All right. Speaking of that, I, you know, I, I would like us to get to the urban limit line pretty quickly. So are there additional comments regarding the actual expenditures. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Okay. I, I just have so one. Hang, hang on. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Arnridge, uh, Commissioner sorry. Durand, Commissioner Peoples, Commissioner Hudson. First. Oh, uh, you're first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, I think we're going to, I just got a letter tonight. Um, I represent the 19 cities. Um, it's interesting that, um, I, 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 let me start off. I, First, I really appreciate all the comments we're getting, um, and I value those a lot because each one has a slightly different perspective. Um, even though we're getting some emails generated by one organization on behalf of people, that's kind of not, um, it's taken up a lot of time to respond, and you find out you're going to respond back in a, uh, a short version of that. Real conversations are great. Um, I have to tell you one of the best conversations I've had with Dave Campbell here, um, to get to know him and understand um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and I know each of us have done that, Julie, and all of us are meeting. Um, I have another meeting with Dave uh, Ramos here from County Connection. We really have an opportunity that we did a million, a billion dollars in Measure C, two billion dollars in Measure J, and we had a two, two point six, two point eight billion dollar shortfall when we had all the projects in Measure J, and we said we we can't afford them all. And the opportunity now is is to, and, and again, that was like, we know what the master plan was to how to make this a great community, a great county, and we couldn't do all of it. And we shouldn't lose sight that our real goal was how to, how to complete that vision um, and not just say, well, I'd like this now and like that. that that's not a master plan. I mean, that's, that's designed by committee. Um, being an architect and planner, 
I can show you what that looks like. Um, we all have those ugly things in our communities. <laughs> um, and the ones that absolutely stand out and those trail systems that work and get you places, those are because people sat down and did a master plan and create the connectivity. So I think the overarching thing we should remember is that really is our goal. Um, we do have a very complex process sitting up here. It isn't just us voting on this. We have to go back to the 19 cities and our county partners and get our fellow council and supervisor members to create a majority to vote individually to bring that back because that's a requirement in this system. Um, there are 75% of our fellow elected who aren't sitting here tonight who are against us funding one of our partners across the board. If it's in there, they're not going to support it. So we've got to figure out how to get around that. We have spent $1.3 billion to date just in East County and the Highway 4, $1.3 billion out of an entire program of $3 billion. So regional equity, yeah, that's a lot of regional equity. We have to, our job is to help balance that um, because when we go back to our own voters and our own jurisdictions, we have to find with clear conscience that we recommend this and why and how it's going to benefit our community as well as the greater good, right? I mean, we all believe in a regional approach because I would like to get out to Brentwood to my friends to go buy his corn, although they sell it in our market, um, that we need that connectivity. And that's, that's the master plan. And we have some real challenges if there are groups who want to show up and say, if you don't do this, I'm against that. that that's not constructive. We all know that. I mean, we, we're not saying that, but by the way, i got to convince four council members in my community who are against funding one of our agency. The same in the next city. And by the way, four of the cities are all in the same boat. So we have to, we got to do a lot of our own heavy lifting to get us to a point of a consensus, but still with a vision, a vision that we're doing the right thing and just not throwing money around because everybody deserves that. Um, agencies gave up um, as a whole. Our 19 cities gave up a lot a lot, $1.3 billion to East County because of a, a, a horrendous, horrible problem. With all due respect, those people that lived there didn't create the problem, right? It, was, it wasn't the appropriate planning and the infrastructure links and all of that land use. It didn't work. So what can we do going forward? Um, we're, we're a transportation agency, the only one in the state of California that has a growth management element. We ought to be proud of that. Um, and we ought to find a way to think about, and I said this last time, that our performance standards, I think, are really important on individual projects and categories, um, recognizing regional equity, because it won't go through without that, but also recognizing that if those um, standards we were just talking about are really clear and straightforward, we have an AB 32, SB 375 requirement. We need to make sure we don't violate that, that we're honoring that, each of our communities. On the specifics of the um, each one of those categories, the wording in there, there are some serious issues in them that need, to, that need to be changed. And you can see letters that are starting to come in for each bird's jurisdiction says, you can't do this. The housing, um, trying to tie these dollars into um, – building more affordable housing. None of us build housing. Let's be clear, none of us build housing. We each have general plans. We each have HCD compliance, every single one of us. Some of us have general plans that are in place and will be there till 2030, and some are a little longer than that. We can't change those. Those are voter, some are voter approved. So we have to balance all of that so we can't come back with a transportation plan that has strings attached to it that prevents us from doing completing the, the master plan vision. And I don't want to change personally, and I don't think any city wants to sit here and tell the county, you have to do something. That's not how we got into growth management. And let's remember, it was a county urban limit line, right? Give the county credit. We all support it. The fact is it was a county urban limit line that started. Um, we need to honor that. And I know there's a lot of fear of um, these changes keep pointing to Bob about this, but bottom line is, is this is a master plan. Let's keep our eye on the ball. We need to compromise. 
we need to listen to everybody. And I think people have been fairly reasonable to date. Thank you. So um, I need to well, I, 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 I want to be polite to all my fellow commissioners. I, we could impose a two-minute rule on our speakers. We could try. We could also impose a two-minute rule on ourselves. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Durant. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so, all right. So, um, I, I'm going to agree with everything uh, that Commissioner Arnold just said. I think that, that that was a right, rational, and and even-handed way to say it. Um, I think it's also important that we recognize that, that all of us are here because we believe firmly in a regional approach uh, to, to, you know, trying to manage ourselves out of the, the challenges <laughs> that we face. Um, but I'm, I'm not in favor of a regional approach that sacrifices local control. And so I think um, just as I'm not in favor of state approaches that, that, you know, impinge on our county control, and I'm not in favor of federal approaches that encroach on, uh, encroach on our, our state and, and county control. Um, so I think there's, there's a real balance to be struck there, and it, it does feel occasionally like we wander too far um, from that. So I'd encourage us to, to not wander that far. Uh, the second sort of broader overarching point with respect to the funding categories is I think it's far more important to, in, to, to incentivize the behavior that we want and, and the, the management uh, whether it's a growth or something else that we want, than to, than to uh, sort of penalize and disadvantage. And, and the way that we structure things in terms of you know, equity, I think, really still requires us to value the differences in the subregions and the differences between our cities and continue to recognize that, that you know, one size doesn't fit all and, frankly, five sizes don't fit all because there's 19, 19 cities plus the county each of which wants to have its own personality, its own flavor, its own solutions to the unique problems that each serve, um, lest we go the way of looking and feeling and, uh, and so on too much like, say, L.A. County, um, with all respect to my friends to the Deep South. But um, so I, th I think those, those two things for me are the most important components of, of getting past sort of the, these things and working our way down into solutions. Yes, uh, uh, I'm glad to follow on with the commissioner because I, I agree with much of what he said. I think this this plan fails to recognize the vast differences in different parts of the counties. I had a 72 operator come here today to talk to you about standing loads with 10-minute headways. And we put the 72R in on the weekends, dropped the headways down to seven and a half minutes, and we still have occasional 70, we still have occasional standing loads. That's, my guess is that's not true anywhere else in the county. And that's never going to be handled by autonomous vehicles. Our planning staff estimated that to carry the capacity that the 72 carries would take 800 vehicles driving up and down San Pablo. Um, so I think you need to recognize that and need to recognize that particularly in West County, there, there's definitely a need for expanded bus transportation. I don't think WCTAC went far enough, but they went further than, than the countywide plan, and I think that's reasonable given the difference in land use and population density and population demographics in the different parts of the county. Thank you, Commissioner Hudson. Yeah, I maybe it's this is a different take. I, I'm kind of going around it. I think the uh, new measure transportation expenditure plan uh, 1.2-9 really is very close. I think it's ready to go to the RTPCs, ready to even uh, try and get some comments after the RTPCs to the cities. I think we're a lot closer than what I'm hearing here. And let me give you an example. If I talked to Dave too, he had to listen to me ramble, so I'll try and keep this. Dave Campbell, so I, I can keep this under two minutes. Uh, they're asking for 5% of the pedestrian, bicycle, and trail facilities, so roughly you move from 60 million to 100 million. Uh, SWAT is 19%, uh, and SWAT is putting in 24.7 million. I mean, we're already doing what they're asking for. And the reality is, as I pointed out, we'll pull a lot more from the 120 million local street maintenance and improvements uh, to combine with that when we start coming up with the best projects. You have to look at each cost benefit. Um, the other thing is, I, I think 
really, as we get into this, we need to take a look at what these alternative scenarios are coming from MTC and ABAG, because I don't want to give away any funding if it's potentially there. We don't know which scenario it is, but we should get involved with it. Uh, last, we heard a lot about 239 and the Trilink. I think that is an extremely important part of this plan. Uh, you heard people talk about truck traffic that was going through Byron. That is a minor part of the traffic that is going to East County. If you really want to see how bad it is, drive back from L.A. about 4 in the morning and go past Wesley, and you'll swear it's the largest city in Contra Costa County. I'm sorry, in San Joaquin. It's nothing but trucks. And that is repeated several times in different areas as they come into the Bay Area, all on 580. You could sit at BART and count 15 trucks, one car, 15 more trucks. It's just over and over again. And then at 680, head north. Um, the other thing that wasn't mentioned is they don't want growth inducing. Uh, our environmentalists, I agree with you, but you're not going to stop Mountain House. That's another Doherty Valley that's going out in San Joaquin County, plus others that are close by that will be built up over the next 20 years. And there is a reverse commute out of Antioch that I didn't realize uh, until I heard it from Don Freitas of about 10,000 people. And we're trying to get them to the lab, to the uh, Pleasanton to San Ramon. Uh, I mean, it's this is a huge number of people on Vasco Road, which isn't exactly the safest road around. So what we're looking at is this is not just an East County problem. I know that the business park in, in my city tried to get buses to commute to Bishop Ranch, and we got turned down from the Air District because we didn't meet the cost-benefit analysis, et cetera. Uh, but I hope they go back into it because East County's not going to shrink, and San Ramon's not going to shrink, and the business park isn't going to shrink. And all you have to do is look at 580, and you'll know that there are a lot of problems out there that we're working on that aren't just Contra Costa. So I, Commissioner Butt. Well, you know, uh, I, I know we're going to have to do it, but – in terms of building 239 and, and, and all of these other road projects, you know, after, after all the money we've spent from Measure J and the measure before it, um, people tell me what road, what freeway has gotten better. None. They've all gotten worse. You know, I heard one gentleman say, uh, uh, everyone is drowning in traffic. I mean, that's what happens, and you can't build your way out of it. Um, you know, any improvement you make is temporary. Every time you build a new road or add a lane to a freeway, uh, all you're doing is inducing growth and making it worse in the end. And so I realize we're going to have to do it, you know. If, if we're going to have to allocate funds to build 239 to get the votes to do this thing, we got to do it. But... I'll bet you ten, if it happens 10 years from now, 15 years from now, uh, it's just going to be worse. It's not going to get. It's not going to get better. You know, this building roads is not the solution to our transportation problems. It's it. It just makes it worse, not better. Okay, Commissioner Romick, and I'd like to end the discussion on this item. Growth is coming, whether we build roads or not. As I stated a number of times here, the majority of affordable housing, market rate affordable housing is being built in East County, for if not just Contra Costa, most of the Bay Area. So people are, are, are looking for some place to live as we grow as a community, as we continue to grow population-wise. Um, infill is happening, and infill is happening in East County. Um, we can't ignore or take away options for transportation in East County. Um, if we want to expand our economic vision and, and, and ability, we need to be able to grow. We need to be able to handle the traffic that we have today and tomorrow. Uh, and ignoring it um, isn't, isn't going to find it isn't going to be the solution. And um, I'll end it there so we don't ramble. Much. Well, thank you. So, 
Um, this is going to come back to us for continued discussion next week. To the extent that you have conversations with people in your region or other people around the county, and I'm sure everyone will, what I would encourage everyone to do is to remember the variety of things we have heard tonight, because success only comes if we collectively find a way to put this on the ballot and get two-thirds approval. Um, so you know, we can't follow any given line of solution here and win. We still need some work to figure out where the, where the middle ground is, and I'm, the people at this table are capable of figuring that out. But with that, um, why don't we go to the urban limit line? Mr. Chair, yes. I would respectfully request that that be put over till next week. We only have 20 minutes, and I just okay. don't think it's going to get done. And, you know, I thought maybe we should go to the next item, but we do have a meeting. I heard earlier that we may have a fourth meeting. Um, I just I want to give it the time and the attention. We may get it done in 20, but we guaranteed to all of us that we'd be out of here by right. 9 o'clock, and I just don't see that happening. Okay. Um, it's will of the committee. But, but just a question. Um, and maybe we don't talk about it, but I, I believe that you, the supervisors, had a meeting on this. Could you at least share that? Sure. So that so that just in a, a objective, broad view, set the table so when we come back, we'll all have the same thought process. Be happy to do so, okay. and, and my colleague also. Um, we did have a meeting yesterday uh, just to go over what some of the concerns that have been raised by members of EPAC. The board is very clear. Uh, we do not feel there needs to be any change to the urban limit line. There's been no sprawl. There's been no uh, abuse of it. Uh, we're still open to conversations uh, around consistency uh, relative to the variety of cities in the county having perhaps different language and or uh, issues on, on acreage. Uh, we're open to the idea of no contiguous, you know, hopscotch kind of thing uh, so that there's clarity and people feel assured there will be no abuse. But at this point, I think it's fair to say our entire board is very uh, committed that we feel that the current urban limit line situation of 30 acres or less uh, uh, has not had a problem. We're all elected officials as our, our cal uh, city counterparts, and uh, that's what the public process is for. So we... Uh, I, Supervisor Pifo was here earlier. I don't wish to speak for her, but she made some very strong comments about how she will not support uh, the TEP and this plan if there is the, I'm not, I'm saying, and Ms. Vanderbrook or Riley is here. I want to make sure I'm correctly quoting Supervisor Pifo uh, that, and, and I think the rest of us, uh, but we're not going to go out there yet, but she won't support uh, a TEP that has any changes other than uh, those that retain lo uh, local control. And uh, we feel that we're in the middle of the 10-year review. That won't be completed until later this year. And uh, we all go through those land use planning processes, and we feel that that is the appropriate place to handle urban limit line issues. And if I could just summarize the staff report in a, less than a minute. Um, if you look at page 1.4-3 and 4, it provides the data on how different jurisdictions currently ha work to amend their respective urban limit line. In summary, it says as 20 jurisdictions, we're all over the map. We don't have quite 20 different solutions, but we're close. And so that led to the recommendation that we at least make those consistent. And there are three components of that. One is the it, that you'd be able to make at least one of the findings that's in County Measure L, which is in Attachment 1.5, really 1.4, that was handed out today. The second, that we have some consistent um, findings regarding what a non-consecutive resolution is, and that's included in a letter from the county to the board back, you know, uh, board to the authority back years ago, and also in Brentwood and Oakley's exhibits at the back of that. And finally, the county and San Ramon require a supermajority vote. And so the third component would be that all jurisdictions would have a supermajority vote before they use the 30-acre exemption. And then there are other categories that are listed for discussion purposes. There's no recommendation. We could do those. We could not do those. All right. Is there any interest in taking up item 1.5? <laughs> or shall we just... 
give ourselves credit for ending early this evening. Well, I, I read the staff report, and, and it was just going to be a, I don't mean just, it was going to be a staff report. It's for information only. Yeah. There was no action. I think it, uh, we can do our homework. I, could, could I did have a question. Or, okay, well, let me go to Ross and then. Well, yeah, I, I agree with Supervisor Mitchoff. The only uh, comments to think about uh, that really aren't in the staff report, one is, uh, uh, these sections are not in Measure J, uh, and sometimes they're buried in an ordinance, and uh, we put it in here, and that's one of the decisions we'll have to make. Is it in the expenditure plan itself, just from a transparency point of view? And then uh, some of the uh, suggestions are, are beefed up from what's in Measure J. So that that's really would have been the tone of the discussion, um, and, and some of the specific points or some of the discussion that happened yesterday at your meeting about governance structure, considering uh, adding some uh, rotation in there for the Board of Supervisors, the um, really changing the Citizens Advisory Committee into an Oversight Committee with some, some teeth and some broader representation. So, yeah, it's all in the staff report, but that, those are really the kind of comments we're looking for. Ultimately, is in the TEP, do we want this additional accountability and transparency and then the uh, Governing structure proposes some some changes, and then there's some other changes that aren't in here that we'll likely hear about. Through the Chair Arnrich and then Commissioner Taylor. Um, oh, Commissioner okay, Taylor. Okay. Um, first of all, through the Chair, I'd like to find out if possible. You might have some speaker cards. People did come, and and, and uh, yes, on that, and they might not be able to to actually make it to the next meeting or whatever. Could we take the comments? Would that be appropriate? I just had a quick comment. I, I, I just want us to keep in mind about um, we come out with two measures. They coexist for a long time. I'm really concerned. This is sort of another layer. We have an oversight um, system put in place now. I don't want that to go away. I think it's worked well. To come up with a new one, find a way that we can deal with what those issues are. But if we create a different governance, these meetings, we'll be having two meetings. Yeah. We'll have to have one set of rules and another, and then you're going to have two oversights because we have an oversight requirement in Measure J. So as much as we want to change and, and make it harder and tougher, and, and I understand some people doing that, yeah. let's really you know, think, what is the purpose of, of the oversight? Is there something we need to tweak in what we have now to make it respond better? And if so, then maybe we ought to consider it for both, not just well, unilateral. Just real quick, I think that uh, most of the issues that's been identified are those of language or where that information is inconsistent. Um, and so that's it's a cleanup effort, I think, more so than anything else, is to make sure that the language is very consistent and that the language is in all documents that's put put out as it relates to the urban limit line. And therefore, I think you, you clean it up because in terms of whether we want to make any changes, it's worked. It, it hasn't been an issue. And those communities that have not wanted to um, live by the urban limit line rules, they went out and got voter approval for their own line. And that's still an opportunity for folks to do so. So far in items 1.4 and 1.5, Stephen Smith. And if you can come back next week, you can hold your comment until then. <laughs> okay, on agenda item 1.4, I have uh, watched the developments on this issue with great interest and more than a little trepidation. Having watched the amount of time invested in this TEP process by so many, my personal opinion is it would be tragic if lines were drawn, in the sand were drawn that could not be bridged by compromise. I have a few points to make as a highly informed observer of the authority since 2006, including service on the Citizens Advisory Committee since 2009. First is the utter absurdity of any one-size-fits-all approach. I am a resident of Brentwood. My city has a very robust agricultural land preservation program and process. It does not have, nor does it need, a hillside preservation ordinance. 
I was for several years a resident of Orinda, where the exact opposite applies. There's a whole spectrum of needs among the various cities. The entire structure of this authority recognizes and is built on the varying needs of the various subregions in our county. I see a new case having been made that the 40 year, the 30 acre year rule has been abused. In my city, the urban limit line, when opposed, resulted in an absurd situation in Western Brentwood, which continues to put hundreds of school children and their parents at risk, serious risk every school day. If a small adjustment in the urban limit line in this area remains possible, we might be able to resolve this situation. I do believe that there is room for compromise in the areas of adding renewed required findings, including reviewing the status of infill development, a limit on sequential applications of the 30-acre exemption, and several other items listed in the staff report. A final observation on the role of compromise in governance. When you adopt an all-or-nothing approach, you incur a substantial probability of receiving nothing. Do you want me to go on to my comments on 1-5? Or no, I uh, Okay, it'd be fairly quick. But it's a whole new topic. As I've mentioned before, I have been a member of the Citizen Advisory Committee since 2009 and have chaired the committee for the past three years. I agree that transitioning the Citizen Advisory Committee into a Citizen Oversight Committee with expanded responsibility makes a good deal of sense. I, observed, I have observed that the base workload of the Citizens Advisory Committee is very cyclic, mostly being tied to the review of growth management program checklists as they become available. It also appears to me that peak financial governance issues generally come to the fore at times when checklist review is at an ebb. Ever since the requirement to file Form 700 was imposed on CAC members, we have had difficulties in attracting and retaining members. I feel then and feel now that this was an overreach based on overly conservative legal reasoning. I strongly counsel that the charter of the Citizens Oversight Committee place it clearly outside the path of direct influence on the authority board's legislative powers and that no Form 700 requirement be opposed. Indeed, I personally regard the imposition of a Form 700 requirement at odds with the very nature of a Citizens Oversight Committee, as it adds an unnecessary hurdle to citizen participation. Thank you. That's what I warned about when we first talked about this. I, I have a rigorous travel schedule, and I built it around the fact that we have these meetings. Right. So that we have an alternate, and he'll have to show up if you're doing it that night. Let's see. I have a city council meeting on the Monday night, traveling Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Friday night is Good Friday. Okay. I think that was enough. All right, so for the others, others of us, you, you'll still be back on for the 29th. So for the others, is does the 23rd work? Yeah. Hearing. So we already have the 16th. Now we're adding the 23rd, and we already have the 29th, which is a Tuesday, remember. Right, so we're adding one on the 16th. All right, so with that, thank you, everybody, and we're adjourned, and look for your packet, which will probably be out on Friday. Yeah.